Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Plug and Play's Batch 9 Travel and Hospitality Expo. Uh, in case you're wondering what this ugly mustache is doing on my face, some of the travel team members, the guys decided to grow a mustache till travel reaches 50% capacity uh, compared to pre-COVID levels. So for the sake of my marriage, I hope you pray for me that travel comes back to somewhat normal in the near term. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, we're excited to have you. We have a pretty exciting morning set up. Um, and uh, we're going to get started with some opening remarks by myself and my business partner, Leo Chen, as usual. Very excited to have Chip Conley back at Plug and Play, or at least virtually. Chip was kind enough to deliver the first keynote for our first Travel and Hospitality Expo back in 2016, and it's taken us uh, roughly four years to get him back. So we're very, very excited to have him on. He's going to be sharing some words of wisdom, uh, management through crisis, which uh, I'm personally very much looking forward to, and I think it's timely content. And then our CEO will do a proper introduction of Chip uh, in a few minutes' time. That's going to be followed by our travel uh, HQ batch nine startups, giving you an update on what they've been up to during the past three challenging months. And then for this expo, we also decided to bring in some of our travel EU startups. Uh, so the folks in Silicon Valley and in North America become familiar with them. That's going to be followed as usual with the corporate and startup awards. And then we'll have some closing remarks delivered by Leo Chen. At the same time on Friday, we also have our sustainability expo. For those of you interested, please reach out to uh, one of us on the travel team and we can send you the details. You can follow the agenda and all the startup information at the following link. Our team uh, across the globe, the first two rows are folks in Silicon Valley. Um, and then the last two rows are team members out of Vienna, Singapore, China, as well as Geneva. So as most of you know, we started the travel and hospitality practice in Silicon Valley in 2016. Since then, we've expanded it globally. Uh, in Singapore, we have a close collaboration with Asian Development Bank and uh, Pacific Asian Tourism Association, looking at innovation around uh, sustainable technologies for the hospitality industry. In Shanghai, we have a very close partnership with Marriott APAC, uh, looking at hospitality tech. Abu Dhabi, uh, we work closely with Etihad, as well as Abu Dhabi Tourism Board, as well as Miral, uh, the company that oversees all the amusement parks there. Geneva is a recent initiative with International Air Transport Association. Uh, it's an accelerator that we run for them. And my colleague, Leo, will give you an update on where that initiative is right now. Vienna is our travel EU program, very much focused, I would say, on the airline and airport ecosystem. We work with about a dozen airports out of Vienna, including Star Alliance. And Silicon Valley, obviously, is still the hub for the travel and hospitality program at Plug and Play. Uh, corporate partners, uh, 34 strong across the globe. Uh, uh, pretty good mix, I would say, between airports, airlines, uh, hospitality brands like Accor as well as travel agencies and TMCs and folks like Trivago on the MetaSearch side, ground handling companies uh, like Swissport. Some numbers, uh, as most of you know, uh, travel came to a complete halt in the past few months, uh, at least in North America and Europe. And uh, it seems like Asia is somewhat waking up and people are starting to travel domestically again. Unfortunately, this has translated into a projected uh, loss of about 100 million people's jobs. And that's going to be equivalent to about a $2.7 trillion impact on the GDP worldwide. Um, on a positive side, what we're seeing is that most Americans, at least, are going to be taking a road trip in the coming months once the shelter in place is lifted across the states. 67% of Americans are expecting to take a trip within three months uh, once the shelter in place restrictions are lifted. On a not so positive side, only 6% uh, are thinking that travel 
uh, air travel anyway will come back to normal uh, under, in under 12 months, which I think makes sense. In China, where uh, I would say they're ahead of uh, where we are in North America and Europe, the positive signal is that roughly 30% of the capacity has come back primarily due to domestic travel. Uh, and the positive number on this slide for me at least is that 68% of the travel stakeholders are doubling down on their digital transformation initiatives. So they're almost looking at this as an opportunity to be able to uh, transform themselves, whereas before they were extremely busy with daily operations, now they have the bandwidth and time and the necessary resources to go through the digital transformation in a much more timely, efficient manner. And then the technologies that we're seeing have become more relevant in recent months, obviously artificial intelligence, automation as it relates to operational efficiency. To our surprise, sustainability is still very much on top of mind. And uh, obviously the customer experience and service provided by the travel stakeholders needs to reach new levels in light of uh, COVID-19. What does that mean? You're gonna see a lot more contactless, queueless, and more hygienic environments in airports, airline cabins, as well as hospitality brands. This is uh, 2031's perspective on what the reopening could look like. Uh, as you can tell, some of the airlines are coming back online via an unlimited capacity in May, uh, namely Etihad, Turkish, Air Canada. Uh, they're gonna be resuming their services in a limited capacity sometime during the month of May. Our own partner, TUI, is gonna start selling beach holiday uh, uh, reservations in mid-May. And then Emirates Airline is expected to go live again uh, with their regular flight operations at the beginning of July. And then going into September, uh, uh, at least according to 2031, we think that's when business travel is gonna come back somewhat online in the US. Speaking of positive uh, vibes, uh, our own corporate partner, Vienna International Airport, who we've been working with for over a year, uh, as mentioned, is doubling down on their digital initiatives. And as you can see on the bottom of this slide, uh, they're uh, in full uh, swing with five startups uh, doing pilots and POCs. And they're having discussions with five more startups to move the collaboration opportunities forward. So, you know, what, what, can, what good can come out of the current crisis, especially in the travel and hospitality industry that was impacted first, and I would, would dare to say impacted most deeply compared to other industries. Um, you know, we are seeing startups be, being extremely agile and really uh, coming uh, on stage and pivoting their services to help people build confidence again, to travel again. And some of the startup presentations you'll see today will talk to that. Uh, the other thing that we're very, very excited about, we have never seen so much collaboration taking place across different stakeholders in the travel industry. Airports are talking to airlines more, airlines are talking to hospitality brands more, uh, hospitality brands are working more closely with ground transportation companies, all in all trying to build the confidence uh, for people to travel again and hopefully provide a more seamless travel journey for everybody uh, during the crisis and hopefully post crisis. Uh, as you can see on the bottom of this slide, according to Microsoft's CEO, from his perspective, uh, two years worth of digital transformation has occurred in the past two months. This is an initiative we're extremely excited about. Airbus joined our travel and hospitality practice uh, in December of 2019, and that they've taken it on themselves to bring all the different stakeholders in the travel industry together and uh, basically reimagine travel. And we're reimagining travel with Airbus, both for the short term, mid term, and long term. And we're hoping to bring airlines, airports, ground transportation companies, ground handling companies, and hospitality brands together to come up with new processes uh, to build traveler confidence again. 
And the ultimate objective of this exercise with Airbus is to have a webinar in a month's time to share Airbus's findings and hopefully plug and play's ecosystem will contribute to these findings. With that, I would love to pass it on to Leo Chen, our Managing Director for Travel and Hospitality Practice, to walk you through a few more slides. Leo, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Amir. In the past two months, we have hosted two special webinars with our corporate partners from Europe, North America, and Asia Pacific. Leaders from Accor, CWT, Vienna Airport, OAG, All Nippon Airways, and Trip.com Group came together and shared their day-to-day -day business practices, learnings, policy-making amid COVID-19, as well as personal thoughts on the journeys ahead. We are grateful for Ken genuine insightful sharing. For those of you who have missed webinars, if you're interested, please refer to the chat window where my colleague Olivia will publish the links to the recordings. During the selection day of our batch night program, we announced three new initiatives coming out of the travel practice this year. While our 20 airports for 2020 initiative is still going strong, the other two projects, including Accelerator at IATA, have been paused for now, at least through the end of summer. Instead, our company is mobilizing all verticals to work on a new program called Social Impacts. Essentially, it is a global COVID-19 accelerator dedicated to scaling the world's most promising startups who can help address the coronavirus pandemic as well as the recovery from it. So far, we have built a platform with four tracks, including health, supply chain, commerce, and enterprise technologies. With strong participation from governments, investors, and corporations, we will look at how technologies across all of our verticals can address the need of those suffering in the crisis. In the next four months, there will be startup pitches events open to the public, as well as private events like deep dive sessions, all of which will lead to our first Social Impacts Expo in September. If you are a startup that would like to get involved, please go onto our website to learn more. If you're part of a large corporation that would like to learn more, please reach out to our head of partnerships, Jordan. His email is jordan at pmptc.com. In addition to our COVID-19 accelerator, we will kick off our batch 10 travel accelerator during the second half of the year. We expect sourcing to complete by the end of June and host our winter expo in November. In the coming weeks, we will coordinate with our corporate partners to host a virtual coffee chat to redefine the focus areas that will guide our ventures team through the sourcing and due diligence process. On that note, allow me to pass the mic over to our head of ventures, Christy. Thanks, Leo. Um, nice to see everyone online today. Um, so I just wanted to quickly go over our focus areas for batch nine. Um, again, just as a recap, we had four kind of main focus areas that our uh, startups covered, which included flight disruption, customer experience, sustainability, and operational efficiency. And today you'll have the pleasure of hearing four more startups from our travel EU program. Um, batch nine was obviously an interesting one, and we hope to work with our startups continuing on um, into the fall because uh, the past three months have been a bit interesting to say the least. Um, even though the past three months have been quite eventful um, and un abnormal, I guess, uh, we still managed to get quite a bit done, um, including a fundraising one-on-one -on -one workshop by our general counsel, Mark Steiner, a pitch polishing workshop, and a circle of CEO session with the founder of Beyond Pricing, Ian McHenry. In addition to that, many of our corporate partners were generous enough, generous enough to uh, give up their time during this uh, interesting time. Our partners such as OAG, um, Swissport, and some of our VC friends like F Prime and Fifth Wall have given their time to talk to our startups and offer their mentorship. 
Um, really quickly before I go, we wanted to highlight uh, an event that's being taking place by our good friends at Focus Right. Um, the online virtual event will be taking place on May 7th, and they'll be covering really pressing topics such as the state of the travel industry right now, um, funding trends in response to COVID-19, and much more. So you can go and find the link in the comment box and register, and I'm sure many of you will find it interesting. So with that being said, I'll pass it back to Amir. Thank you, Christy. Um, and thank you for keeping the lights on with the startups and the current batch. I know it was a lot of heavy lifting on behalf of the Ventures team to add value in light of the COVID-19 crisis. With that, we would love to uh, transition to our keynote. Uh, as mentioned, Chip Conley, uh, who we're very excited to have back at Plug and Play, uh, is going to deliver some words of wisdom uh, to you guys. And Saeed, uh, I want to make sure you're on the line to do a I proper am. introduction for Hi, Chip, Chip since you've known him. Hi, Hello, Chip. Saeed. Good, good so to see thank, you. Thank you so much, Amir. It's uh, really a great pleasure to introduce Chip to our audience. I have known Chip for more than 20 years and he still looks great. He looks as great as 20 years ago when we met uh, at YPO. And, uh, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced visiting Joa Aviv hotels. I think what Chip does incredibly well is the experience you have and the culture of anybody who I have met in his team. Quite frankly, his leadership, and I love to learn more about wisdom uh, that he passes through to his teammates at Joie de Vivre, at Airbnb. And now, Chip, I'm a little bit hurt because you didn't invite me to Baja, Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> I would love the first chance uh, we get to meet each other face to face. But uh, to pass it on to you, Chip, you have been inspiring leader for me, for all our colleagues. And I love to hear more about your new book, Wisdom, and how you see the light after this challenging times. Thank Please, you. Please, uh, audience, here is Chip, and here is very good friend of mine, and I'd be very excited to hear what you have to say, Chip. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed. It's great to see you. Uh, and I feel honored to be in the plug and play community again. I've had the good honor of speaking down in Sunnyvale uh, on a couple of occasions before. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my frame for uh, leadership in difficult times and then move into the conversation about you know, what, what do I see recovering more quickly and what changes do I see in the industry, maybe long-term? Um, so I'll do my best. I'm, you know, my crystal ball can sometimes be very cloudy. <laughs> I, I have been lucky enough to be one of the first boutique hoteliers in the US um, uh, alongside of Ian Schrager and uh, Bill Kimpton and, and Joie de Vivre grew into the second largest boutique hotelier in the US and is now part of the Hyatt chain. Um, and then I jumped on the Airbnb bandwagon over seven years ago when the, the founders of Airbnb approached me when they had a tiny little tech startup um, and wanted me to help them disrupt the industry that I had been a part of. <laughs> so, so I became uh, the, Darth, the Darth Vader of the hotel business um, because I still owned hotels, but I was also helping to uh, steer the rocket ship with the, the founders. Um, and then more recently, the Modern Elder Academy, which I think is the, it's the world's first midlife wisdom school. I'll talk about that too. Key lessons for leadership in a difficult time. Number one, and I've learned this, and actually it, Brian Chesky's learning this right now, uh, having uh, laid off 25% of the staff at Airbnb yesterday and all consultants. Um, so I would say number one is 
uh, leaders are the emotional thermostats of those they lead. You're not the thermometer, you're the thermostat. What's the difference? So the thermostat basically means that you are the, you set the climate control. And one of the things that a lot of um, leaders don't recognize is that the more senior you are in leadership, the more your actions, inactions, grimaces on your face um, show up. People notice things uh, and your team is noticing your emotions. Uh, so I, one of the things I want people to recognize is that if you are anxious as a leader, your anxiety will be a contagion for everyone else. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be transparent. It just means that if you're gonna be transparent and vulnerable about what you're going through, uh, including if you need to, to shed some tears, which is perfectly fine. Uh, there's a great New York Times article about that in the last couple of days about leaders shedding tears. Fine to shed tears. Um, but the thing to know is that you better match that vulnerability with some vision. Uh, because what people are looking for is for you to, to actually be transparent and authentic. And that may mean that you are struggling with certain things, but they're also looking for you to actually remind them of the North Star of the company, where you're going, why you, why you all joined this company in the first place. Um, so one of the key things to know is just, you are the emotional thermostat. Just remember that anxiety equals uncertainty times powerlessness. Those two ingredients, um, because there's a lot of anxiety, it's probably the, the predominant emotion right now in most companies and especially in travel or hospitality companies. If anxiety equals uncertainty times powerlessness, how do you create a little more certainty for your team? Usually that has a lot to do with transparency. Um, and how do you create the sense that people have some powerfulness in, in, in what they do? How do you help? One of the things we did during my joie de vivre era during, we went through two once in a lifetime downturns, what were supposed to be two once in a lifetime downturns in the same decade. This one's worse, but that was the dot-com uh, and 9-11 period and then, uh, and SARS uh, and then the great recession. And one of the things I learned that was a really interesting and cheap way of helping your employees understand that they have an impact um, is we had 52 boutique hotels over the course of 24 years that I ran the company. What we do is each of the individual hotels had a, a staff meeting once a month with all of their team. And what we started to do is bring in customers to tell their stories. <clears throat> so, you know, in one of the hotels, there might be a customer who's staying there who comes every week and they're sort of a road warrior who stays in the hotel. And there's a reason they're staying in that hotel. What we ask the customer to do is come into the staff meeting, give a five minute pitch for why you love that hotel and, and mention at least two or three of the employees by name and explain why it is that they are, have been very val valuable to you. What is it that they do that actually makes it your experience better? Because one of the things a lot of employees need to hear is that the work that they're doing is important. Otherwise, if you don't think the work's important, you'll have, you'll have a tendency to not give much attention to the work you're doing. Okay, so another learning uh, under, this, under the category of learning to lead in a downturn is make sure everybody's clear about the metric that defines success. There was a metric that defined success before COVID. That metric no longer <laughs> exists. If you're still focused on the pre-COVID goals you had, you are going to have a very depressed team. So for us uh, in the downturns, the, the, what I really liked using as our primary metric was market share. Because market share allowed us to see how we're doing relative to our competitors. Uh, so in, in the hotel world, that meant we had Smith Travel Research reports that would give us the opportunity to see How's our market share versus the competitive set for each one of our hotels? And the reason that this is important is number one, you gotta get people aligned around what defines success. And then once you've done that, you need to help people to create what I call the momentum of victory. Nobody wants to be on a losing team. And if you're in an industry, everybody feels like they're on a losing team. But the truth is that pain is relative. <laughs> 
And some companies are more in pain and suffering than others. You want your company in a difficult industry to feel like it is a company that is going to survive. The momentum of victory is, it means the following. You identify on a regular basis, uh, preferably weekly, what progress is happening in the company. Some of it may be procedural, it's things you've got accomplished, but often it is um, the data that you're getting around this new most important metric. In our case, it was market share. And in our downturns, we showed that 80% of our hotels were gaining market share. Very unusual for boutique hotels to be gaining market share in a downturn versus chain hotels. The chains have a much bigger you know, network. Um, but the fact that 80% of our hotels were gaining market share was something we just kept coming back to over and over again. And then we'd also talk about other things too. So if you create the momentum of victory, what you end up doing is creating an environment where people feel like we're making progress. There's a great book come, that comes out of the Harvard Business School called The Progress Principle. Highly recommend you buy it. Um, it just basically talks about the fact that most companies um, are really focused on the idea that, I'm sorry, most people are focused on, are they making progress? When you're making progress, you feel both happiness and success. Um, and then the last thing around just what to learn from a downturn is we did an exercise uh, at both Joie de Vivre and at Airbnb, uh, uh, the following exercise. And I think it's actually not a bad one for you to do for your company right now. Um, it's, it's called the what business are you in exercise. Uh, we learned this from Peter Drucker, the management theorist. He said that the most important question any organizational leader can ever ask is what business are we in? And so, I learned this at Joie de Vivre. We, we started it there. So we did this in the bottom of a downturn. We had our top 12 executives, our leadership team in a room. We split up into six dyads, two people each. Um, and one person and two people would face each other. The first person, the questioner would ask the question to the other person, what business are we in? Um, and the second person, the person who's getting the question asked to them would then have to answer that question. What business are we in? Well, for Joie de Vivre, we were in the boutique hotel business. Then the first person who asked the question would say, thank you. And it would ask the question again, what business are we in? And the second person would have to answer, but they can't answer the same way twice. So that process, and you go, you do it five times. So by the fifth question, you've done an archeological dig to really get clear on what's your differentiator. What's the thing that's the essence of your organization? And this was what got us to at Joie de Vivre, knowing we were in the identity refreshment business. Each of our boutique hotels was different. And what we felt was that the guests who came and stayed at our hotel would have uh, their identity refreshed based upon the personality of the hotel. So if you liked the Hotel Vitali, which, was, which had five adjectives that defined it, modern, urbane, fresh, natural, and nurturing, you felt a little bit more modern, urbane, fresh, natural, and nurturing when you left. And if those adjectives meant something to you, we'd created a differentiator beyond a, what a normal boutique hotel would create. Similarly, at Airbnb, when I joined, the month after I joined, I helped lead an offsite retreat with our leadership team. And we came to the conclusion using the same exercise that we were in the business of helping people belong anywhere. Belong anywhere ultimately became the marketing phrase that defined uh, Air Airbnb and had a lot to do with what the company's organizing principle was uh, because I, I was the head of uh, global hospitality and strategy for the company. Okay, now let me move to the next subject, which is startup advice. What startup advice would I give you um, as, as young startup folks? Well, <laughs> number one is stay liquid, and I don't mean drink yourself to death. <laughs> Staying liquid is so important. It, 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 yes, you could drink if you want, um, drink alcohol, but it, the staying liquid is all about just your cash flow, your burn rate, your burn rate, and just knowing that as Brian Chesky just showed yesterday, and I've spent the last seven years being Brian's mentor in-house for four years and three years now as a strategic advisor, Brian had to get to the place that was really painful for him to say some of his pet projects, some of the things that he felt really defined the company's long-term strategy and goals, he had to make some tough decisions and make, a, make some, get back to the, the clarity of what is the core business of, of Airbnb. So there's a lot of uh, projects like, for example, transportation. He, 
Brian, uh, Brian hired uh, Fred Reed, a friend of mine, who was the founding CEO of Virgin America. He was president of Delta and moved to Ponza. He was going to come in and help create a whole transportation component, uh, that mostly air transportation component to Airbnb. But that, you know, in this in this um, shrinking of the staff by 25%, that's an initiative that had to go away, at least for now. Um, so being really thoughtful about your cash flow, essential, you know, I, I'm saying something pretty obvious there. Number two is focus on solving your customers' problems. It's really easy in a downturn like this to get incredibly focused on your own problems, <laughs> like cash flow, and actually move away from the bigger question, which is what is the customer problem I'm trying to solve here? Um, so for, for me, um, one of the things that I loved doing there was um, we were in the process uh, when I, my first hotel was a place called the Phoenix. Um, and the Phoenix is, a, it, it, I still own it uh, 34 years later. Um, it's a broken down motel in the Tenderloin of, of San Francisco. Um, I bought it when I was 26. Uh, I, the, the market we were going after was musicians and artists and entertainers who are traveling. Well, in launching that hotel in uh, early 1987, um, I didn't know a damn thing about the hotel business. Uh, and, and so I, but I did know about marketing and I said, okay, who is it that makes the decision of where, where, um, where a band stays if they're on the road with their tour bus and all. And I, you know, we went to three different groups of people thinking, Okay, entertainment travel agents, they booked them. Well, they do, uh, but, but actually they, did, they weren't the primary decision maker about where the band was gonna stay. Okay, secondly, the venue. Uh, in, in San Francisco, that would have meant, oh, Slims or the Great American Music Hall or the Fillmore or the Warfield, a bunch of musical venues. And maybe they book where the band's gonna stay. Nope, not really. Thirdly, it was like, maybe it's the management company that you know, the management company that you know, usually based in Nashville or New York or, or LA, nope, they didn't do it. What I found was the, the decision maker for where a band was gonna stay was the tour manager. The tour manager usually was five years older than the rest of the band. It was almost always a guy. His job was to make sure that nobody had an, a drug overdose or got hijacked by a groupie and, and you, that you couldn't find your, your band member. And so the, the customer problem we were trying to solve with him was two. There were two key things that were really on the mind of tour managers. Number one is where will we park our bus? And generally speaking, that was a really hard problem for a lot of uh, hotels because there wasn't really a great place for bus parking. If there was, like a, if there was a, a parking garage, you couldn't fill it a bus. The bus is way too tall. Well, we were a motel. We were a motor lodge that had a big open parking lot. So we got that right and we didn't even charge for the bus parking. So that was number one. Number two, and this came with time, I figured it out. These tour managers were so stressed out, the unrecognized need, I wrote a book called Peak, How Great Companies Get Their Mojo from Maslow. And the, the key for customers, the transformational need for a customer is to figure out their unrecognized need that they didn't even tell you. The unrecognized need for a tour manager was they were stressed out. So what we did is we had a massage studio uh, in this motor lodge and we offered for, for the tour managers, if they brought us 10 room nights, a free massage. Um, and so we started getting the tour managers calling us from Denver or Dallas on their way to San Francisco saying, I can't wait to get there. I'm so stressed out. So there, the, the thing you may solve for, for a decision maker may not be obvious based upon your, you know, the, the product you have but there may be something specific that actually is quite popular across those kinds of decision makers. Because once the first tour managers figured this out, they told all the other tour managers. And it's part of the reason why um, this funky motel in the Tenderloin started having Linda Ronstad and David Bowie and all kinds of other famous people staying there. Number two is in terms of startup advice, focus on your evangelist. Uh, you know, the Airbnb founders in their early days, 2009, when they, we, they were accepted into Y Combinator, they basically spent all their time, they were a San Francisco company, but they spent all their time in New York because their evangelists were in New York. New York was the place that they knew they needed to learn from. And so they literally went door to door learning from the hosts in New York and then also spending time with the guests and actually going and being a guest with the hosts in New York and giving feedback to them. Um, 
All right, so let me move on to the next subject because I only have about 10 more minutes. Um, so how, what's gonna happen in, tra in terms of coming back, the travel come back? You know, which, which parts of travel are gonna come back? Anything that has a, a really savvy digital component to it, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in it. And I, and I know a lot of people in the plug, plug and play uh, world are in the digital space. But just recognize that your, your digital product better be solving a customer problem, not something that feels like it's frosting on the cake. Because quite frankly, right now, most of the hotel industry and the travel industry is going to get back down to basics. So if you can actually solve something that's a basic problem that actually saves money, that'll be really high priority, or creates a better relationship with the customers or employees, um, you're probably in good, a good place. If you're actually pr providing something that was more appropriate for a different time uh, when people had bigger budgets to work with, I would say it's time for a pivot. Um, so which parts of the industry, here's my priority of where I think you know, travel is going to make the comeback. Um, I appreciated what uh, Saeed showed earlier in terms of uh, the timeline. Uh, you're going to see really quick comeback in certain parts of travel. Anything related to family travel or special occasion travel, uh, anything related to family reunions, uh, important birthdays because you you know someone only has a 75th birthday once um uh weddings zoom or virtual reality weddings just don't cut it um in fact with the wedding business because so many weddings got got um either canceled or postponed this spring there's going to be an overflow of people trying to actually have fall weddings so there's a there's some real opportunity there another opportunity is transformational travel it's actually, some people call it the fastest growing segment of travel. What the heck is transformational travel? Is it going to, the, going to Peru and doing ayahuasca? Well, yeah, it could be that, but that's not the primary part of uh, travel, transformation travel. Transformational travel is when you go on an experience, not to sit in a, in a lounge chair and drinking a colorful you know, cocktail with an umbrella on it. It's actually to go to learn or go to make a difference <clears throat> or go to experience a deeper connection with others. Um, so that could be going to Canyon Ranch and, and actually, you know, going to uh, some kind of personal uh, retreat there, going to Bhutan and studying with the monks up, up, in, up in the Himalayas. Our Modern Elder Academy is an example of, of transformational travel. And we're just getting the phones ringing off the hook right now. We're actually closed till October because of the pandemic. Um, but because our whole business model is premised on the idea of helping people navigate midlife transitions so that they can repurpose themselves in new ways <clears throat> and to reimagine their mindset around aging. This is a pretty big business right now because there's a lot of people losing their jobs, a lot of people trying to figure out at age 45 or 55 or 65 what they're going to do with themselves. So that's, I'd say that's a, another segment that's going to come back. Staycations will come back quickly so that people drive destinations um, will come back. Um, I think leisure will come back faster than corporate. And that's partly because corporate is getting very used to Zoom calls now. Um, I do think in the fall, there'll be, a, there'll be a, uh, a lot of corporate retreats, offsites, small offsites um, to talk about 2021. Uh, I think that the, the business planning for 2021 is going to be more in depth than it's probably ever been in terms of an annual cycle of looking at where things are going. Um, I think that overall corporate travel probably will, will make some comeback in the fall, um, as will international travel, depending upon public health and depending upon how much we've controlled this virus. Um, I don't think people are going to exclusively wait. Some people will exclusively wait until there's a vaccine to travel, I think, uh, on a plane. I think that's a small uh, percentage of the um, regular traveling public. Who's going to get hurt the worst? It's pretty obvious. I mean, the, the cruise industry is going to be in a rough place for a long time. Um, and major conventions and meetings. I think major conventions and meetings are going to completely have to rethink themselves. If you can be in the business of really creating an experiential um, convention conference uh, that has elements to it that feel built into like an, a, a unique experience as opposed to just 
<clears throat> what's happening right now, which is me just talking at you. Um, I, I think any kind of technology there's going to is going to has a great opportunity. Um, finally, uh, as I wrap up with my last three or four minutes here, um, in terms of major changes, what are we going to see? Well. Um, yes, we'll see lots and lots of technical things that allow people to avert the front desk, <clears throat> allow people to actually have some kind of health maintenance system that allows them to sort of get a sense of what's the health, the wellness of a room. I mean, I think companies like uh, Delos um, are going to get very popular because, frankly, they have a lot of money and they're all about wellness and all about cleanliness uh, and applied to uh, originally to office buildings, but now to hotels as well. But here's actually, I think a really interesting premise. There, there was a, there's a company in, in London called The Collective. Um, I've been the mentor to the founder. In fact, just before this call, I was on the phone with him um, with our weekly call. Uh, so there's five different uh, founders that I am, uh, an, um, a mentor for right now. They're the they're poised to become the the largest and maybe the most respected um, co living company in the world. And what's been interesting to see in their in their business in the year and a half that I've been involved is a real shift. So what we know is there are hotels and there are homes. And hotels are about Marriott and all and Hilton, and homes are about Airbnb or VRBO and, and second homes, vacation homes. What I'm starting to see is there's this hybridization and the collective is a co-living company. Co for those who don't know, co I think you mostly know co-living I'm sure, but just quickly co-living is about small residential units, bigger social spaces. So there's some risks in a pandemic about that. But what it is is it's creating a package price um, so it makes a, affordable living uh, work and, and sometimes in certain places intergenerational living work. Um, the average size uh, uh, collective building is about 500 units. So it's a pretty big building. What's been fascinating is their business, their strongest business before the pandemic is the people staying a week to three months. Uh, so they're based in London. They're, they're, some of their initial projects are there. They have, they have three kinds of customers, people staying a week or less, people staying three months or more, and then people staying a week to three months. So the extended stay travel business, we know has had a real opportunity for a while. It's been fat, growing much faster than the overall hotel industry. But here's the part that get, that where COVID makes it interesting. Digital nomads have gone mainstream. What do I mean by that? I mean, I think one of the more interesting trends will be the need for service departments which is something we don't see in the United States much. In fact, the hotel industry, the global hotel industry has done a really poor job of creating an extended stay product. Uh, you know, extended stay America, residents in embassy suites, nobody wants to stay in a, one of those buildings, one of those units for more, you know, it's just like one boring room with a second boring room. <laughs> uh, very predictable, not particularly interesting. What I think we're gonna see is a growing number of people who are gonna say, you know, I don't have to live in the place that I've always lived because I'm actually, I can work remotely. I can travel to the office from where, from some other place. And therefore I can actually be a little bit more footloose um, and untethered in terms of where I want to live. So what you're going to see is, and I've seen it already at, through Airbnb and then now at the collective, but what I'm seeing absolutely right now is the number of people who have chosen to move beyond their traditional home and maybe even give up their home. So they're looking for not a home away from home, but a home instead of home. And so I think the trend of people being more mobile, Wi-Fi being better on the, all over the planet, people wanting to travel and not just travel and visit a place, but travel and live in a place for an extended period of time two months, three months at a time, and then move on to another place uh, is gonna be a big trend. And there's a lot of opportunities with that. So with that, um, it is now time for me to, to wrap up uh, and just say, I know there's lots of chats, lots of Q and A's here, but I was told that, you know, I'm here to talk to you for about 25 minutes and then um, I, I, that's all I can do. But unless, unless uh, 
Saeed has uh, something else in mind, uh, or uh, Amir has something else in mind. Um, I'm open to however you want to, however you want to take it. Thank you, Chip. Uh, first of all, really, really good insights. Uh, you know, I follow you on LinkedIn and I love your posts. I wish you would have more of them on a regular basis. It always puts <laughs> a smile on my face. Um, there are great questions here. Uh, if, we could, if we could spare five more minutes with us, yes. that would be much, much appreciated. Yes, let's uh, do it. On one of your LinkedIn posts, Chip, not too long ago, uh, and you touched upon this earlier, you mentioned that progress is essential for all human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, and that could be progress in your personal life or it could be progress in your professional life. I wanna focus a little bit on the professional life as it relates to young entrepreneurs and the travel industry. Mm -hmm. Obviously making progress these days, be it with uh, fundraising, be it with your clients who were paying clients and now they're looking to get, a, get out of those contracts has become very, very difficult. Yes. So my question to you is uh, in the context of your professional life, if you were a young entrepreneur, again, at the right age of 26, when you started Joie de Vie, yeah. um, what does progress look like in an environment where you know, everybody's telling you no and it's very hard to move the needle in your professional life? And then I would love for you to give us some insight. Does that mean that young entrepreneurs need to focus more on personal progress in the meantime until the environment improves? And how do you balance the two? So, so a few thoughts on that. Number one, uh, the, I have a, a daily blog called Wisdom Well, and it's on the Modern Elder Academy website. But if you just look at Wisdom Well, Chip Conley and Google, and you'll find it. And we tend to post those on LinkedIn. So that's, that's what, you're, what Amir's uh, re referring to. So there's a daily, typically a daily blog. Um, Here's my recommendation. The thing I did at age 26, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> especially during difficult times, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> so I started something called the wisdom book. And it was just a little notebook like this. And it was like a journal. And every weekend, I would make a list of what I learned that week. So the, so the lesson and often the learning, the things I was putting in there were my painful lessons. Um, and so for 34 years now, 33, 34 years now, I have kept a wisdom book. So I have about eight of them now. Um, and every weekend I will go to it and, and I will actually make a list of the things that I learned that week. Because making a list of the things you've learned is a way to metabolize some meaning and some learning and feeling a sense of progress. And I got to tell you, when I went through the Great Recession, I went back to my wisdom book from the dot-com bus 9-11 to look at some of my lessons there to say, can some of those lessons be applicable today? And it was true that they could. But very few of us actually cultivate and harvest our wisdom along the way. So the progress principle on this would be your progress is going to be your learning. It may not always be the effect of your business in the short term. In fact, you may have to close down your business. You know, one of the other key lessons is like you're good. There are certain times when you need to actually accept that failure is not, not the way to look at this. It's a, the noble experiment is the way to look at this. You try a noble experiment and the headwinds were too strong, but you learn something from it. And if you can actually metabolize that learning in such a way that wherever you go from here forward, you have your wisdom books and they can actually be right there. If I would go, if I were you and you, and you sh shut this business down six months from now and you went out and raised money a year from now, I'd go into the venture capitalist, I'd go into the private equity, I'd go into the seed capital and say, here's my wisdom books. And I use my wisdom books as a way to metabolize what I've learned along the way. If I was an investor, and I am, <laughs> I would be really impressed. Additionally, I would reach out to people older than you, not because they're smarter than you. I, I, when Brian and me, man, I, he, I, was, a, I was a mentor. I was a, as much an intern as I was a mentor to Brian because I was learning from him. But people who've been around a little bit longer have gone through some downturns. This one's the most severe. Just, you know, so let's just start by saying, you know, Either, one, either of the two I, I've mentioned before, the dot-com bust and the 9-11 um, as well as Great Recession were nothing like this. But 
these people who have been through it before have pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is another form of wisdom, another way of de defining wisdom. Pattern recognition means you can sort of see things early and then you know how to respond accordingly, whether it's business strategy or it's you know the emotional intelligence of the team and how they're working well together, et cetera. Um, and that's been the number one thing I've been doing right now with my founders that I, that I mentor is helping them see, here's the pattern recognition, here's the priority. You have to focus your attention right this week on this, get that solved, and then we can focus on something else next week. But the natural thing for a lot of founders right now is to be scattered, to be going in 25 different directions at once, um, when in fact, it's really about prioritizing and focusing. Thank you, Trip. And how lucky are we to have access to your wisdom books uh, you know, that, that have been compiled over the past few decades? Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Chip's latest book is Wisdom at Work. And as he mentioned, he does have a Wisdom Well blog. I highly recommend you check them out. I learn from them on a regular basis on the blog. Every time he posts, I learn something new. So thank you for uh, providing that content to everybody, Chip. Um, just one final question, if you can answer this in less than 60 seconds. I know we're yes. taking more time than we should. Uh, a question on the Q&A that I think is on top of everybody's mind is uh, digital immunity passports for people to be able to actually travel again with their friends, family, and rest assured that uh, you know either they've had this virus and they don't have to worry about getting it again or transmitting it uh, if they're ace it, it's a, uh, don't show any symptoms, if you will, and don't know if they have it. What, what are your thoughts on that digital immunity passports to get travel going again for those folks who have not been impacted or have been impacted who are not going to be transmitting this virus to others? I think the, I think the hard, I mean, I, I, I like the idea of it. I think the hard part of it is it's going to have to be flexible enough because, because we're going to have more pandemics. So, so <clears throat> as long as it's got the flexibility to address the next set of viruses. Maybe we won't have more pandemics, but we'll have epidemics. Um, and an epidemic, of course, is more centralized to certain locations. So um, I, I like the idea of it. I do think it's a, it's a natural. Um, and I think that, frankly, you know, biotech is going to be the key um, area of, of, of innovation, um, not just in the travel space, but just in all, in all spaces in the next 20 years as a result of this. So um, I think uh, companies that actually can m mix biotech with travel, um, I, I think uh, are, are on a very smart path. But it's in, in 60 seconds, it's hard for me to say much more than that. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Chip, right. for your time. Always a Thank pleasure. You. It Thanks only to took me four years to get you back as a keynote speaker. So yeah. I'll, I'll try again in four sure. years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Thank, Thank you, you so Saeed. much for your time. Really great, appreciate it. Great that. seeing both of you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, with that, uh, I would uh, love to thank Chip Conley again. Hopefully everybody benefited from his wisdom. And uh, we're going to get into the startup pitch uh, portion of our uh, expo today. Again, we have about 17 startups from the Silicon Valley uh, Batch 9 Accelerator program, as well as a handful from our Travel EU program. Uh, I would love to introduce our own Jesse Johnson, who's going to be the MC for the startup pitches. Jesse, on to you. Thank you very much, Amir. I appreciate it. And thanks, Chip. That was a great presentation. Uh, I'll definitely be checking out one of those books and, and trying to read it as quickly as possible. Um, Welcome everybody to batch nine of our travel and hospitality program here at our Silicon Valley program. Uh, my name is Jesse Johnson. For those of you who have not received an opportunity to meet today, I am one of our corporate partnerships managers here at, for our travel and hospitality program uh, with the goal of, of bringing progressive corporations onto our platform. There's just a few last items I wanna go over before we, we get the show on the road. Uh, first and foremost, like Amir said, today you're gonna be watching 21 startup presentations 17 of them, which are going to be the ones that belong to our current travel and hospitality program here at Silicon Valley. And the other four are from our EU batch zero. Um, if you, oh, most importantly, if you would like to connect with the startup that you see today present, um, there will be a pop-up poll on your screen towards the end of each presentation. I'll have a yes and a no button. Hopefully uh, we can't mess that one up too badly, but if you would like to be connected, press yes. Olivia will connect you via email after all the presentations are, are over. 
Um, there will not be a live Q&A session, unfortunately, but in the chat box, if, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A functionality. Uh, please type in the name of the company and your question, and they will be able to get back to you via that chat box below. Um, without further ado, uh, please let me welcome the first, first startup that we have out of the day based out of Richmond, Virginia. We have Nate Marcus from Occasion Genius, whose platform provides large companies with the power to leverage information about upcoming events. Hi, my name is Nate Marcus, and I'm the founder and CEO of Occasion Genius. Today, travel has become more experiential and more personalized. But travelers have kept missing out on the upcoming events, uh, both near and far. Uh, and events, as opposed to activities, events are those special occasions that happen once a month, once a year, sometimes once in a lifetime. And until now, there's been no comprehensive resource or personalized resource for these events that drive travel more than activities. Occasion Genius is an innovation and personalized event discovery uh, technology that's helping companies uh, now, especially uh, with a generation uh, of demand. And yes, now, while nearly all events are canceled, but we've uh, come up with uh, great ways and we're excited to announce the Plug and Plays partners, how we're helping brands prepare for the upcoming pent up focus on live events during this time. We're excited to announce our travel worthy events data set to you. Um, and here's how it works your brand via our API provides a wish list or bucket list of the most exciting events worldwide that are currently postponed. So these are events such as the Running of the Bulls, the Korean Mudslinging Festival, uh, or Oktoberfest. Your users select the events that they would like to go to. And using our technology, your brand can be the first to let them know when new dates have been added to the events in their wish list, not just next year, but every year after that. Here's how our groundbreaking and patent pending technology works to help generate demand during this time and build brands, as well as learn more about end users. First, we aggregate all of the events that are happening in a comprehensive way. Second, we understand each event at a sophisticated level using what we call the event genome. Third, we help your brand create personal interest genomes or profiles on each end user and leveraging those recommend the right events to generate travel. Not only are we the most comprehensive, we're also the highest in quality. We're the only event in uh, technology on the market providing uh, non-copyright infringing descriptions and commercially licensed photos. We also update in real time. Uh, in terms of when events come back, our technology has been and will be used in a wide variety of applications throughout all five phases of the guest journey, including the dream phase. Adding events to your website will increase direct bookings, we're finding. And during the pre-stay phase, sending an email campaign which we call proactive concierge, will allow guests to stay an additional day through extensions increasing ROI. Lastly, in the stay phase, uh, our technology uh, interacts with existing apps uh, and integrates to increase uh, on-site downloads and engagement. Now, during any of these phases, you can learn more about your end users through personal interest profiles and inspire future travel through hyper-targeted email campaigns, inviting people who are foodies, for example, to join uh, and travel during the upcoming food uh, uh, family-friendly festivals. Uh, and this hyper-targeting is so important. Google and Amazon have oodles of oodles of information and are able to create personalized relationships with travelers moving forward. And our uh, uh, partners are excited to be able to use our event inventory to create and augment personalization profiles. Our technology has won multiple awards, including recently at the Focusrite conference, and we're seeing accelerated brand traction through some of today's largest brands. Our experience management team is here and excited uh, to help you and your brand personalize and differentiate, especially during this time. Thank you. All righty, thank you, Nate. Uh, as I mentioned before, for those of you who are just joining us, there is gonna be a pop-up poll on your screen towards the end of each presentation, asking if you'd like to be connected with that startup. Uh, if you click yes, Olivia, our program manager for our program, uh, will connect you via email after the presentations are concluded. Uh, but with that being said, up next, based out of Berkeley, California, with Heidi Lim from Opus 12, 
whose team captures carbon emissions where pollution is generated and converts CO2 into chemicals and fuels. Hi everyone, my name is Heidi Lin and I am the Chief of Staff at Opus 12, a Berkeley-based startup that has developed a technology that recycles carbon dioxide into valuable chemicals, materials, and fuels. Our technology takes CO2 and water as inputs, and we use renewable electricity to split up those molecules and rearrange them in the presence of a metal catalyst to produce new products that are typically produced from fossil fuels. At scale, we can turn two to three billion tons of CO2 into products that touch upon a $300 billion petrochemical sector. These are our co-founders. Kendra and Natasha were two graduate students at Stanford uh, where they discovered there are actually 16 different chemical products that can be produced through this process. They teamed up with Nicholas, who's our CEO, and they developed the first prototype a few years ago. Um, since then, we've grown the team to about 30 people, and we have developed our first commercial systems and are scaling up to our industrial size systems. We're focused now on producing two chemical products uh, from CO2. That's carbon monoxide and ethylene. CO is a chemical building block for materials like polyurethane, which is the foam in your running shoe or in the seat cushion that you might be sitting on now, uh, as well as polycarbonate, which is a hard plastic. Uh, you can think about like the headlights of your uh, car. Uh, we can also produce fuel products like jet fuel from CO2 through this uh, route. Ethylene is the basis of most modern plastics and other chemical formulations uh, and uh, also a very valuable product. A future that is possible is that you'll be able to take a carbon neutral flight across the Atlantic wearing carbon negative clothing and holding a carbon negative uh, suitcase. And that's a future that we're working towards. We can impact CO2 emissions in two different ways. Uh, CO2 is actually consumed in the process of making the products that we produce. Uh, and we also avoid emissions associated with conventional production. Uh, for ethylene, that's about a five ton benefit. So there's a large benefit across different molecules. We've quite a lot of traction across uh, private and public funding. We also have a number of partnerships with industrial players, corporate partnerships. Uh, we are working with Shell on, uh, sh on producing fuels from CO2. And we recently partnered with Daimler to produce the world's first automotive part from CO2. Daimler is the parent company of Mercedes-Benz, and we actually produced uh, part of the interior of a car from carbon dioxide. Uh, we produced polycarbonate, and they put it on, into actual production, um, where they actually showed that this is a material that they could drop into an existing supply chain. This is only one example of the types of materials that we can impact across automotive and other consumer goods. Our technology is essentially a version of an existing technology, which is water electrolyzers. These are technologies that have existed for decades to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And we've changed one component, which is the membrane. So it's essentially like changing the SIM card in your phone. It's one piece of an existing technology that we focus on. And we've partnered with the world's largest manufacturer of these systems to scale up. Today we have the first commercial units, which are uh, producing carbon monoxide at this dishwasher scale unit, uh, number one. And we are, over the next two years, scaling up to the first industrial units, which will consume tons per day of CO2, uh, the number three on this slide. From there, it's a modular unit. We can actually string many of them together to address large scale industrial emissions. Our customer base and partnership uh, ecosystem consists of companies that need to reduce large scale emissions, companies that can use our downstream products and renewable electricity producers. So our reach is quite broad. Thank you very much. I look forward to meeting you. Feel free to email me and follow up and connect. Thank you. All righty, thank you, Heidi. Uh, I'm just gonna remind you guys for the first couple of presentations, but the pop-up poll will be in front of you on your screen. Um, if you click yes, Olivia, our program manager, will connect you after the presentations are over uh, via email. With that being said, up next, we now, based out of Madrid, Spain, we have Dennis Vilovic from Troop Travel, which is an event location optimizer powered by big data. Hi, this is Dennis from Troop Travel. For sure, you're asking yourself right now, why should I listen to startup pitching and corporate meetings and events right now? where we know that 98% of all travel has been stopped. All meetings and events basically are canceled. Well, maybe you're interested to learn how is it possible that we grew our customer base of Fortune 500 companies by 200% since the outbreak of COVID-19. 
Let me explain to you what we do. Let's imagine we are organizing a meeting of 300 people and they're coming from 35 different places from all over the world. The very basic question is, what is the best place for them to come together? Where do they meet? Very simple question, but extremely difficult to answer. There are hundreds of factors influencing the decision of where to meet. And it's so complicated that people tend to base their decision purely on opinions. And that's exactly what we do differently. We are a big data analytics platform which aggregates thousands of data points around different elements which helps to optimize meetings and events planning. So we compare destinations according to costs, ease of travel, visa requirements, carbon footprint, safety, but as well health. So I guess now we understand why actually in our current times, it's even more important to ask you, where do we meet? Imagine you're organizing a meeting in the United States, or maybe you want to take into account the COVID-19 infection rates per state. That for sure will help you on identifying what is the best place for your group to, to come together. Or let's think about your organizing meeting on a global level. Well, travel restrictions are extremely important to consider. And not only for one person, for the full group. Here you see the green countries are the countries US citizens can currently travel to. Well, those are the countries you can travel to when you start from Spain. So by combining all the things, you will know which countries or which places are actually options for you to have a meeting. We're defining the new normal here in meetings and events planning. And we're not doing this alone. We're actually doing this together with our suppliers and clients. We have put advisory boards into place and we're discussing each and every element of the future of the new normal of meetings and events planning. The supplier advisory board are partners from each and every step of the journey and our customer board is made up of 4,500 companies from all over the world, from different industries, representing hundreds of thousands of employees worldwide. One key thing of the new normal is optimization. Optimization around risk, around cost, around carbon footprint. And that's in the end the backbone of what we have always done. We have shown that by applying big data analytics, you are able to reduce your meetings and events costs by somewhere around 40%. Hybrid meetings is part of the new normal. We will have meetings where we have people coming together in person and people dialing in at the same time. Maybe we have hubs of people coming together in person, different hubs, and then they're connecting virtually. And that's something, one of the additions we have done to our technology that actually today you are able to, to add virtual participants to your analysis. Local and regional will be the first areas where people will have meetings again. So already our technology allows to optimize on a lower regional level. You can select different transportation methods. The system will compare different cities and you are able to optimize on a regional level, but even on a very local level. So just like you can see here, a hypothetical meeting in the Bay Area with different participants coming from different places. And the question here is, what is the fastest place for them to come together? Travel a journey. Very important element. We are looking together with our partners to identify each and every steps of the traveler journey. Identifying the risks of each and every step and measures how can we avoid any of these risks. And all these things together explain why our customer base has grown from four to 12 Fortune 500 companies since beginning of the year. So join us in creating the new normal in meetings and events planning. Thank you so much. All righty, thank you very much, Dennis. Um, next up, based out of London, we have Randall Darby from Airporter, who has developed an innovative home bag check-in and delivery service. Hey, I'm here to introduce you to Airporter, which is powering the future of airports. My name is Randall, I'm the CEO and founder of the business. And baggage has been increasing in its importance on the industry agenda. Here you can see a number of comments from key players, all of which point to the same thing, that the way that whole baggage is handled needs to change. It's very space and energy intensive. Um, it needs to get more intelligent, become more distributed. It needs taking out of the lobbies of airports. And the sooner you can get bags through the process quicker, 
then the sooner you can get passengers through your process quicker. The truth is that flying with baggage sucks. Uh, it just simply hasn't kept a pace with improvements to passenger processing. And we're all so familiar with this image in the background, standing in a queue, waiting in line. Why is it so easy to fly without a hold bag? Why can't that be replicated when you travel with a bag until now? We developed a product for this, which is super simple. A driver using our technology can now turn up at your house and collect your bags, taking you through a quick workflow, scanning, validating your documents, a couple of security steps. Your bags are then securely delivered to the airport into the baggage system. And depending on your destination, you can either pick them up from the reclaim or they can be cleared through customs and with an integ integrated delivery partner delivered onto your end address. We've got an amazing track record uh, in the UK, which is where the business started. We have fulfilled over 140,000 bag delivery orders, and that was doubling in size and scale uh, year over year. We've got thousands of rave customer reviews, five-star reviews, successful B2B partnerships and integrations with airlines, airports, and other key travel players like Amadeus. And we've had a pretty um, hectic few weeks, obviously with the COVID pandemic hitting. Uh, we had to suspend all of our kind of operations across UK airports. But we're now looking forward to a world post COVID. And we're actually expecting a vast increase in demand for our product as we help our partners rebuild confidence in their travel. How do we do that? Well, obviously, now you can be segregated from your bag at your doorstep. You can travel through the airport in a way that reduces your touch points. Uh, you can avoid queues. You can have a much more contactless journey, all of which helps with social distancing. And in fact, IATA recently ran a survey and 74% of people surveyed said that they would be interested in using off-airport services to help with confidence in flying. Our technology platform provides smarter baggage management end-to-end -end with aviation security policy compliant workflows. We turn enormous operational complexity into customer simplicity with nice digital products. So you can now track your driver, your bags, get digital bag tag receipts, excess payment receipts, uh, all fully supported um, through our technology. Our solutions, be those with the technology itself or our processes, are very much plug and play with our partners. We're building a network of existing operators around the world who can pretty quickly start yielding significant benefits from partnering with this product. So whether you're an airline and you're looking to reduce the impact uh, of people on your check-in staff to drive improved net promoter scores, to help with confidence and uh, drive ancillary revenue as your business recovers, we can help you. As an airport, if you're looking to reduce queues land side um, and to help with social distancing and releasing baggage system capacity, we can help you. As a ground handler, if you want to leverage introduction of baggage to the system early to help with on-time performance and generating efficiencies which can be passed on as cost savings to your airline clients we can help you and if you are a baggage delivery operator or courier operating in a certain country and you want to fill up your vans get incremental business and orders um, then you can partner with us and start using our technology perhaps because of all these powerful stakeholder benefits that's why IATA and ACI named two key innovations which are going to shape the industry and the future of air travel over the next 20 years and those were off airport and advanced processing so we feel that our solution is firmly in the sweet spot and if you want to turn baggage into a service and power your operation into the future and out of covid then get in touch all righty thank you randall now based out of Athens, Greece, I would like to introduce Alexandros Trimis from Welcome Pickups, who is offering a top-notch mobility service for the world to travel. Hello, my name is Alex Trimis and I'm the founder and CEO of Welcome. Welcome offers the best mobility service in the world for travel. Welcome has basically two clients, the traveler and the partner. For the traveler, we want to take out any friction or stress wherever you arrive and make your trip start at that moment you reach the destination. For the partner, we want to be a global, quality, trustworthy, fair price partner for all his travel mobility needs. The welcome service takes a commoditized offering that's a point A to point B transfer and turns it into personalized, frictionless travel experience that is priced for the masses and not for the top 1% of travelers. 
We are using technology to alleviate stress and humans to create the best possible experience. Our goal is not to change just the first and last hour of the trip, but to create a seamless end-to-end -end travel experience. One of our newest products is called Sightseeing Rides, and it's about longer rides inside or outside the city <clears throat> to visit landmarks and explore the destination at your pace in a totally customizable, personalized way that protects you also from the large and unhealthy crowds. Welcome is becoming a global category leader in travel, having welcomed more than 1 million travelers in 57 destinations in 2019. We are not only serving thousands of people, but based on their view, we have created the best rated product in travel with an NPS score of plus 89. Now, in the post-COVID era, we believe that travelers will look for the safest alternatives in much more detail and will travel in smaller groups. Partners will also look for providers who keep very high health and safety protocols. Welcome was already one of the safest way to arrive, but with our new safety initiatives, we're becoming by far the best solution for travelers and partners alike. Few of these initiatives is a contactless ride, separators between drivers and passengers, and close health monitoring of the driver. Now, apart from providing an excellent service, Welcome always tries to be one step ahead regarding personalization. Welcome has a unique position before the hotel and after the airline, as well as the 45 minutes with the traveler during the ride. Due to that, we gather very interesting data and provide a personalized intro and outro of the destination, as well as guide the traveler for what to do in history. In the post-COVID era, we are adding another dimension in personalization, which is health and safety. To make sure that we're doing a proper job regarding safety, we're introducing a new feature, the net safety score, to make sure we're actually the safest way to travel on the ground. One of the main ways to get travelers is hotels. We're working closely with more than 1,000 partners in order to help them in all their mobility and operation needs. We streamline operations, pass rich data to them, offer a great service to their customers, create extra revenue, and now making sure their customers arrive uninfected to their front door. What we're doing with hotels, we're now expanding it to vacation rental owners, but also to bigger players like airlines with great success. We onboarded 3,000 vacation rentals since the beginning of plug and play and closed our first airline. Apart from hotels, vacation rentals, and airlines, Welcome is taking steady steps to expand its service to even more verticals like travel agents, OTAs, and business travel. All this is supported by a very strong team that we have gathered from the best companies out there. When we started, our focus was to create the best travel mobility solution. Now, our goal is also to be the safest. We know that what we do is very relevant to many of you, especially in the post-COVID period. We are already receiving many partner requests, and we hope that we will have the opportunity to also partner with you. For any requests, please reach out to us at partners at welcomepickups.com. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Up next, based out of India, we have Zest IoT. Good morning. My name is Amit Sukhija. I'm founder and CEO of Zest IoT. Zest IoT is Boeing Horizon X accelerated aviation focused venture. Aviation platform is designed with a view to serve the needs of all three key stakeholders in the airport ecosystem, delivering collaboration, connected operations, economical and time savings. Pilot at one of the leading international airport revealed 80 wrong parking decisions, which can lead to additional 2 million USD annual revenue from existing infrastructure. Ground handlers reported 10 to 15% additional savings from cost and revenue leakages. Besides that, airlines also observe potential savings of two to three minutes per aircraft turnaround. A quick snapshot of web application demonstrating planned versus actual operations performance. How does it work? In step one, IoT sensors or camera AI devices are installed based on selected use cases. In step two, Data from devices leads to digitization of many blind spots of operations, enabling precision time stamping and single source of truth. In step three, platforms stitch various data points to enable workflows for quick information exchange. Specially designed user experiences deliver quick decision making and conflict management of precious resources in time crunch situations. Solution is GDPR compliant 
and edge computing reduces compute cost by approximately 70% while delivering safety use cases. COVID-19 was a good reminder for this priority, which had 100% exposure to aviation sector to take a step back and find opportunities to survive. Glad to learn that technology, product and expertise found many use cases outside of aviation industry within a span of four to six weeks. First step is to redefine the business model for aviation. Along with Cisco, who is this priority business partner, there is a new business model offering, airport in a box. Entire infrastructure, security, communication, and platform is offered in a pay-as-you-go model. This will enable airports to avoid capital budgets as well as hassles of multi-party solution integration. Let's take you to a different sector, banking. Using IoT and leveraging just IoT expertise, team has built a prototype in two weeks to reverse cast the ATM screen on mobile. Prototype is underway with leading ATM manufacturer to deliver cardless, contactless cash withdrawal at ATMs. Timing is right for such technology and use case is also extended to any touchscreen kiosk. Camera AI found an interesting use case in oil and gas. Edge compute can detect defective LPG cylinders from production line and using automation, isolate the defective ones to bypass line in real time. Addition of multiple components will not impact the production capacity while significantly boosting the safety for end consumers. Zest IoT has been onboarded by leading fueling company with 50 plants across India, where each plant delivers 12,000 filled cylinders per eight hour shift. Thank you very much, Amit. Uh, up next, based out of New York, we have Sonia Shaw from Pelota, whose technology leverages predictive analytics to help passengers rebook flights for free during disruptions. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sonia Shah, CEO and co-founder at Pilota, where we use AI to proactively mitigate travel risk. And I want to start by addressing something that's at the forefront of many of our minds today, which is how we as an industry can begin to prepare for what the future of travel is going to look like. And while that future is very uncertain, one thing that has and always will be, number one, is traveler safety, health, and well-being. And after this pandemic, traveler anxiety is going to be at an all-time high. So it's up to us to ensure that we're providing the utmost transparency about the safety, health, and well-being factors that contribute to a traveler's journey so that they can feel safe, informed, and have peace of mind while traveling. Because as these travel bans lift, but the threat of COVID exposure remains, travelers will be looking at all of you to provide them with the tools and guidance to empower them to stay safe. We at Pilota recognize this, which is why we've adapted our company to fit these needs and have brought in our technology offerings beyond flight disruptions. And now we at Pilota help to keep travelers safe and informed by using AI to analyze health, safety, and disruption risk of a traveler's flight to empower better decision-making and proactive risk mitigation. And while our new technology is currently under stealth, there are some things I can share with you here today. During the pre-booking process, our travel health and safety tool can be used to identify which flights and itineraries pose the least health, safety, and disruption risk as travelers plan their journey increasing transparency and enabling better decision-making when travelers are planning their itinerary. During the post-booking process, our health and safety tool can be used to help travelers prepare and take necessary precautions to limit this risk while on their journey. All the while, our flight disruption AI algorithms can help them proactively mitigate any potential delays or cancellations that arise on their trip, relieving traveler anxiety and giving them peace of mind. I think we can all agree we're at a pivotal point in travel history right now. And many of the people in this room are going to be the ones that provide the tools and guidance that travelers need to make them feel confident getting in the air again. So let's prepare for this new era of travel together and provide the highest level of duty of care to these travelers to keep them informed, safe, and healthy. And I would love to share more about our new product with you. So let's set up a call Feel free to email me at sonya at flypilota.com or reach out to the plug and play team who can help us set something up. 
I would love to show you a demo and show you the capabilities of what our new technology can do. Thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing from you. All right, thank you very much, Sonia. Um, next up, and based out of Bangalore, India, we have Varun Gupta from Me Tripping, an intelligent travel search platform helping consumers and travel agents make the best travel decisions by making sense of the world's information. Hello, everyone. I'm Varun Gupta, and I'm the founder and CEO of Me Tripping, where we're building the intelligent tech stack for travel. We all know this problem. People are different, the backgrounds are different, their perspectives are different. In travel, those differences contribute to an increasingly complex problem. Additionally, health and safety, which was once a good to have or something to manage, will now go to being front and center of all our travel decisions. Given this, intelligent recommendations have never been more important on where you go, how you travel, where you stay, and what you do. A unique confluence model of user plus historical and live data plus applied AI can deliver this cognition across the travel value chain. Our ranking algorithms, or as we call it, the understanding of world's data, is the plumbing of the travel internet to spin out intelligent solutions at scale. We deliver this cognitive intelligence through a proprietary product, Pathfinder AI. It understands your desires, does its magic, and allows delivery of incisive recommendations through any channel that travelers would like to engage with. All our recommendations will soon include a safety index that will cover not just the impact of COVID-19, but also other health aspects one must be aware of when considering travel. As airlines, hotels, and tour operators come up with their own safety standards, we will incorporate those safety features into all downstream travel decisions. As I speak, we are applying the finishing touches to this new and very important feature, which will also be available as an API. So how do we do this? We spent over three years building IP that no one company has built before. It spans across the entire funnel of travel and includes machine learning, deep learning, AHP, geospatial analysis, advanced statistics, and a ton of data, almost 100 terabytes of it. The B2B product suite is available to small and large travel companies alike. We provide dynamic packaging for leisure and corporate travel, activities itinerary generator, and hotel location scores through various models of partnership. To contribute to getting the travel industry back on its feet, for all partnership agreements signed within the next 45 days, we have slashed our prices by up to 70%. There is no time like now to use the time away from operations and build for the future. We'd like to play our part in that. We've already signed up several large companies in India through whom uh, the product is now available to 65,000 plus travel agents. We've also been having very positive conversations with several companies through plug and play, and hopefully we'll have some of you joining this growing list of partners. You've been picked as one of the top startups by multiple companies and publications of repute in various parts of the world, certainly from India, but even more so from Europe and the US. By December, 2021, we expect to hit about $2.8 million in annualized gross margins with a near even split between B2C and B2B. Interestingly, as part of our Pathfinder Alliance, our B2B customers will benefit from growth of our platform, be it on the B2C side or on the B2B side. We are currently also raising $1.5 million to deploy towards two primary purposes, developing strong delivery mechanisms, uh, example, productizing B2B integrations to reduce integration time by 80%, we are also redefining corporate travel search and booking through grade level itinerary optimizations. This is in addition to investment in making more products accessible by our partners. The other focus area for capital deployment is in further developing deeper and broader intelligent solutions. If there is indecision in the mind of the traveler, we want to have an answer for it. Our 16 member team comes from Harvard, Carnegie Mellon, USC, IITs and more. This experienced team has a background across startups and large enterprises, B2C and B2B, travel and non-travel in India and outside India. We would love to work with you on creating a new paradigm of travel decision-making. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Varun. Next up, based out of Dublin, Ireland, we have Carl Lewin from Sanctify, a global members club that grants access to wellness activities at airports. My name is Carl Llewellyn, and I'm the founder of Sanctify, an essential companion for the post-COVID business traveler. The problem every organization is faced with is, even when the world starts turning again, how am I going to get my guys out on the road? 
how am I going to equip them to be better travelers with better habits and access at every airport to make their trip healthier, safer, and better for them? Travel was always tough. It just got tougher. Frequent travel is detrimental to our health. It depletes our immune system, and now just when we most need it. And now we need to, you're going to be experiencing even higher levels of stress. We're going to be more conscious about the risk to our health, our hygiene, and our resilience when on the road. An airport journey is going to be fundamentally different with that huge emphasis on personal space and wellness. Employers will need to change how they equip their people for this new reality. And what we see is that in travel, wellness will be every employer's number one priority to demonstrate a renewed duty of care in guiding their team to better travel habits and services to improve their experience and their resilience. We see Sanctify as being the solution, that app to guide, direct, and give easy access to everything good for us to do when traveling. Access to wellness, relaxation, fitness, and leisure facilities, airports, go to and all the tools to help change our travel habits for the better, all for the price of a cup of coffee per month per staff member. Today, we're at over 130 airports. There's 140 international airports with 20 million passengers. So we have 90% coverage with over 2,500 location partners, the world's largest global wellness network, including our secret sauce, access to airport hotels, gyms, pools, and spas without booking a room. We offer all our members, you know, everything from 10 minutes to six hours, the options to be able to do gym, walks, runs, uh, swims, yoga, quiet zones, meditations, quick sleep, showers, healthy options during the, uh, at the airport and the surrounding areas. We're using this period to grow our outdoor and quiet space network to give greater distancing options to our members um, at busy locations. Members also enjoy unlimited access to a library of our own content, exercise, stretch and meditation and well-being along with wellness travel tips, everything to make that journey better for them. It's all simple to use in an app. If it's a free to use place, we just give you the directions and instructions how to get there. If there's a charge involved, then we automatically pay for it and book for it in the app. So you can just simply turn up and enjoy. Our market has always been B2B to C. We sell to organizations that want to take better care of their traveling staff, like Google, GE, and Genin, and to loyal, global loyalty and travel platforms that want to reward their customers, like Vodafone. Our leadership team is the grey haired and in my case, a little bald. We have over 70 years experience in international sales, hospitality and loyalty. Sanctify is four years old now and we spent the first two and a half years building the product, gathering customer insights, adapting what's growing our partner network. Today, we are the largest airport wellness network with over 14,000 paid members and in normal times, we welcome new members and usage every single day. We are raising at the moment, would be for us, um, and a late stage seed round to help us grow our sales team and to build greater API functionality to allow our enterprise licensing of our content and our distribution. I'm Carl Llewellyn, and I'm passionate about changing something that is bad and broke into something well and good to earn rewards for our partners, our investors, and our customers along the way. Travel well. Alrighty, thank you, Carl, and uh, apologies for butchering your last name. Um, just as a reminder, though, if you guys do have questions for Carl and any of the other founders of the presentations you've watched today, uh, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to include the startup's name uh, and, and feel free to ask your question. Uh, but with that being said, now we have Matt Bonney based out of Miami, Florida with Daycation, a platform that allows guests to enjoy hotel amenities without getting a room. Hi, I'm Matt, co-founder and CEO of Daycation, and we allow anyone to enjoy hotel amenities for the day without getting a room or spending the night at the hotel. In 2015, I went to Cancun with my family, and we stayed at this small hotel on the beach, and every day we'd walk up and down and see these awesome hotel pools and think to ourselves, wouldn't it be cool if we could just go in there for the day? But every time we went in, we would have the hotelier say, you can't come and spend the day unless you're an overnight guest. Well. It turns out that hotels are pretty reliant on overnight rooms, and in fact, according to Lodging Magazine, over 68% of their operating income comes from overnight room sales. But at Daycation, what we believe is that there's a whole world of opportunity beyond the rooms to be optimized and sold to the end consumer that is not spending the night. So we already do this with hotels from all the brands listed. Uh, we've sold over a million dollars in our product offering, and that is our mobile app and website where hotels can list 
experiences and access to their amenities on property so the guests can come and enjoy that without getting a room. We also provide the hotel with a way to list and sell access to cabanas, amenity spaces, and new experiences on their own white label webpage, which we build and help them integrate to their site. This all comes back to a back end where we regulate occupancy, pricing, and much more, and it's easy for the hotel to use. Our guests are loving this. Uh, they're giving us five-star reviews. They're giving the hotel five-star reviews, telling friends and coming back, which is exciting. And hotels are making millions of dollars in additional food and beverage sales due to vacation, along with driving bottom line revenue through our product. Hoteliers like Steve are loving the fact that it's driving revenue, but they're also loving the fact that vacation is integrating the property into the local community. 70% of our guests are from within 30 miles of the property, which is fantastic as you think about building a more robust set of experiences and products that can drive revenue, even in a post COVID era where we may see a reduction in international and domestic travel. We're working with brands like Selena to launch at scale. So we're ready now to be working with many hotels at once. Um, and we can do this with ease as a company. It's free to sign up and we do a rev share agreement. So mutually beneficial to both as we drive more volume. We're also working with third parties in the industry to drive more volume to us and ultimately to our hotel partners to help them get out of the dip caused by COVID-19. We've also seen that Vacation has amazing investors like Jason, uh, Laura, John, and Peter. They've invested in companies like Calm, Uber, Jet.com, which is great. Um, and so we're learning a ton from them and growing with them, building an internationally dominant marketplace in the experience category. We've been featured in a number of different outlets, which is mostly important because of the fact that they're catching on to an industry-wide trend, which is that hotels are not just about spending the night in a room, they're experience providing platforms. And that's something that we're really excited uh, that the whole industry is paying attention to. We've tripled our business in the last year. We're growing rapidly and we plan on booking more than $4 million in gross volume this year. We've raised some capital already, $400,000, got to 70 hotels and booked more than a million on the platform. We're now raising more money to get to a thousand hotels to be booking more than 2 million per month by the end of the year. My co-founders and I all turned down amazing experiences to work on vacation. I dropped out of Brown um, and they left respective companies. But we're excited to work on this um, to help the industry continue to diversify and create optimized revenue streams for them. My contact information is here and I'd love to chat with you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, up next, based out of London, we have Urchana from Upgrade Pack, an app that makes upgrading your flight or hotel room a breeze. Hi, everyone. My name is Urchana and I'm the co founder and group COO of Upgrade Pack. As you're aware, we're in the midst of some really challenging times, and it's crucial now more than ever that we think about how we navigate this crisis. We believe we're in a unique position to help our airline and hotel partners return to profitability faster. Upgrade Pack is your new, indispensable ancillary revenue partner to help boost your revenue post-coronavirus and into the longer term. We have built a unique, innovative ancillary revenue channel to help you maximise revenue and retain customers. We do that by offering a closed marketplace of affluent, frequent travellers from banks and credit cards who buy subscriptions from us. The main plus point here, it costs you nothing. All our revenue comes directly from the financial institutions who offer Upgrade Pack to their best customers as a benefit for banking with them. We see a 25% utilisation rate compared to the average 1% for other benefits offered, and that is what keeps our platform entirely free for you. Our platform works in a really simple way by directly connecting airlines and hotels with our affluent user base. We work with real-time technology which allows our partners to retain price and control and through our app can put an end to the gamification techniques such as auctions. As we take no fees or commissions, all we ask is that you present a pre-negotiated saving on the upgrade. By doing so, we can produce a new revenue channel creating billions of dollars in additional revenue each year. There's never been a more important time to focus on maximising occupancy and we're here to support your margins and boost ancillary spend for the post-crisis rebound in both domestic and international travel, with our users being the first to travel again. We're both an iOS and Android app. You simply pop in your booking reference and search for an upgrade. 
through our APIs, we return our user's booking and assemble the best available upgrade, which you can see on the first screen. On the second screen, you see the public price crossed out in red and today's upgrade pack offer in green. It's a great deal. So our user adds their CVV, agrees the terms and clicks purchase, and the upgrade is complete. The original seat has now been released and offered up for resale, creating yet another revenue opportunity for you. So how does this help you? Well, with occupancy rates around 74% per flight and the majority of this capacity at the front of the plane, we tend to see an example like this, where there's missed revenue opportunities up front and paying to offload the four oversold seats at the back. This obviously isn't an ideal situation, and that's where we come in to help you fill the half-empty premium cabin up front. Here is the same flight, and you can see how Upgrade Pack has rectified the problem. We have four people in blue upgrading using our app, which has freed up the four yellow seats in economy. These yellow seats can of course be resold, but in this instance, we have been able to reconcile the four oversold seats in green, saving you the money you would have paid to offload those passengers. We're a 100% technology-powered platform creating a direct relationship with your customers and the financial institutions we work with. We're enterprise ready, we leverage Google Cloud's infrastructure and we're PCI compliant. We directly connect with you and don't store any card details. All payments are handled directly by you. Our app is extremely easy to globally scale, only requiring localization from market to market. We will gain many data points around travel behaviours and you can now secure additional revenue in advance as we can upgrade immediately rather than waiting for those ancillary sales at the end. All of this again at zero cost to you. Our users trust us because we're affiliated with their bank or credit card and this trust with your product and our app creates a much higher propensity to upgrade shown here. Through our testing we deliver the highest propensity to buy hence providing the most ancillary revenue for you. As Upgrade Packers seem to be Upgrade Specialists, we see a propensity to buy through our app of 68%. This occurs due to the behavioural traits of finding their own deal compared to half that when the upgrade is presented by the airline. Our users state they feel that they are being sold to by the airline, thus shying away from upgrading. Upgrade Pack is your new indispensable ancillary revenue partner, helping you drive your revenue further. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Urchana. Uh, next up, based out of Canada, we have Andres Kolar from Trip Ninja, a technology that automated, automates the creation of complex itineraries to lower operational costs for TMCs. Hi, my name is Andres Kolar, and I'm the CEO of Trip Ninja. While we've historically focused on multi city, over the last few months, we've made some major shifts in our product strategy. At our core, we are and always have been an automation and intelligence company. Because of that, we are best positioned to help agents deal with anything that is complex, which ends up being most of the flight booking process. Let me show you what that looks like. Travel agents deal with hundreds of variables, making their job difficult and time consuming. To find the best fares, they use a ton of data sources from various consolidator portals, GDSs, and even B2C sites. On each tool, they'll compare dates, passenger preferences, routes, and different ways of breaking up the ticket. They also need to consider baggage and fare upgrades. This can result in dozens of searches. On a complex itinerary, this takes minimum 20 minutes. COVID-19 changed the world. And as an industry, our work will be harder than ever because of constantly shifting regulations, routes, and carriers. COVID-19 has added to the existing complexity in a few ways. First, Agents' existing knowledge of what usually works best is now obsolete. This is a new world, and there are way too many variables to do this manually. Second, many agents are close to retiring, and unfortunately, some won't be coming back. And finally, agents will be responsible for cross-checking the latest restrictions and ensuring compliance. This means each itinerary will take significantly longer to put together. As an industry, we need to prepare for the rebound. While companies have always wanted to improve processes, now it's not optional, but imperative to embrace change and improve efficiency. Trip Ninja improves agent efficiency in three key ways. We're content agnostic and use your data sources, consolidators, GDSs, LCC aggregators, and NDC providers. That way, all bookings count towards your airline incentives. 
With all your content in one place, we save agents time and can mix and match segments between data sources. We replicate and improve the tactics of experienced agents using machine learning. And finally, we automate processes to reduce agent time for booking. QuickTrip, our agent-facing platform, provides agents with intelligent recommendations and more information throughout the booking flow. This makes onboarding easier and reduces operational costs. We're working on features that will further help agents improve efficiency, like those having like having more visibility into prices at the time of date selection and COVID-19 travel notices. QuickTrip is powered by a suite of modular APIs which can be used by OTAs looking to enhance specific aspects of their booking flow. For example, several are using FlexTrip and FairStructure, our multi-city products, to power their on-site and meta search queries. For multi-city, our origins, we're able to provide substantially better pricing than the GDS standard searches. This takes an experienced agent 20 minutes, and we do it in 20 seconds. We are working with several travel partners and have booked over 38,000 flights with them. We're also, we also have several pilots ongoing. Trip Ninja is raising a $700,000 round at this time. If you're interested, please reach out. We're eager to chat with you and see how we can work together to in increase agent efficiency to best position you for the rebound and travel. In lieu of networking later, We'll have two webinar sessions for demos and Q&A. If you're unable to make it to those, you can also schedule a demo by emailing me directly. Thank you very much for your time. OK, thank you, Andres. Um, up next, based out of the Netherlands, we have Michael Rose from Bidroom, a no commission hotel booking platform. Hi, my name is Michael Rose, CEO and founder of Bidroom.com. Bidroom is a subscription-based marketplace where travelers can find the best deal and hotels don't pay a high commission. Our travelers, the members, also get more. They get upgrades in their hotel and also benefit from other services and discounts, which could be car rental, tourist activities. The hotels we have on board, they contact directly and we connect it with them as well to their channel manager. There's a problem going on. I'm not talking only about the current crisis. But there's actually, if you look at the hotels, for years they pay enormous commissions, 25, 30%. And who's paying for it? Indeed, it's the traveler who's paying those high commissions at the end. If when you talk about the current situation, of course there's a crisis. And especially our industry travel is hit really, really hard. But I think in our case, as a startup, we can come back even stronger. We have the time now to close more partnership deals, to get more hotels on board and improve our product. So we believe we can come back even stronger. We don't want to be another booking.com, no. We are a marketplace, as mentioned before, subscription-based. So before people can make a search, they can book, they have to become a member. It also gives the opportunity to the hotels to giving us the best rates available. Everything we do is really based on technology and data. The market of travel was growing every year and year and year. This year is a different year, but I know it's going to be come back strong. But if you look at the subscriptions, they're booming now. We have a business model which is actually focusing on subscriptions. So this market is booming and growing even quicker. If you're looking at our product, we have a great website, amazing user interface, where you can book over 120,000 hotels. You can search, you can book easy, and make it more personal. If you look at the business model I mentioned before, we have a subscription-based business model. Our members, they're paying 29 euro or $29, and in return, they're saving on their journey. But if you're looking at the average saving only for the stay, it's already more than the membership fee. For us, it's really important to get a lot of hotels on board. And that was our big focus last year. So what is actually Netflix or Spotify without any inventory? That's why we had a full focus on inventory. And still now, even now, we can see the numbers of hotels growing even quicker than before. Uh, yes, we do charge them as well, but it's a small fee. It's transparent and it's fair. Only when we deliver them something, we just ask them for a really small fee and not high commissions like others. Many hotels already joined our revolution. Big chains like IHG and Windham and many, many more that already joined our platform and giving the best rates available. Imagine chains already, but also partners like Visa joining with us and partnering with us to even give something extra to their, to their cardholders. 
We, may, we won many awards in different countries, which means actually doing something really right for the industry and something that could become really a game changer. How do we get our users? Partners are really important for us. We close partnerships with many, many in the travel industry, with cities, with I Amsterdam, for example, tours and activities and many others. And they helping us to also grow for our user base. They have already a relationship with their members and they could help us as well. I mentioned two already before, Visa and Avis. They're giving something actually to their members, to their, to their uh, clients, but also we do something reverse. We're helping each other. And we can do the same for airlines. For airlines, we can build a white label solution, which actually can give their uh, loyal customers something even more. Redeem your, your miles for a bit of membership, we give them something extra. I mentioned before the whole economy is changing. We're living in the membership economy when actually people are changing from ownership to access. Recurring services are more than normal. And actually you become partner of somebody. You become getting a relationship with a platform. We have a great team uh, led by me. We have four other industry professionals come from the industry, from the hotel industry and actually successful entrepreneurs make successful exits and they want more than have to join our team to do one more. We want to grow this company, become big, a game changer and a new way of making travel available. We don't do it together. We don't do it alone. We have also a great team of 85 other people who every day working hard, still now working every day hard to change it, to get hotels on board and make our members happy. I'm more than happy to tell you more. So please feel to contact me and I wish you all a great day. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, next, based out of France, we have Jean Christophe from Ascendance Flight Technologies, a hybrid air taxi looking to disrupt the aerial mobility market by providing an inexpensive green and silent air transport solution. My name is Jean Christophe Lambert, and I am the CEO of Ascendance Flight Technologies. Does this look familiar to you? Have you ever been stuck in the traffic jam? going to the airport or to a very important business meeting? I'm sure you did. It costs a lot, more than 50 billion of US dollars a year. For US, China or Europe, it is a global issue. But it's not only about money. It has a social impact. You spend, in average, more than a year stuck in the traffic jam in your working lifetime. This is why. We design at Ascendance a VTOL vertical takeoff and landing aircraft called ATEA. ATEA can transport four people over more than 120 miles at the speed of 120 miles per hour. Compared to helicopter, it makes low noise. It divides by four the noise. It is cost effective, dividing by three the acquisition price and two the maintenance cost. It makes no emission and it's really safe with a full redundancy systems. That means if you have any failure during the flight at the rotor or engine level, no worries, you stay safe. So now imagine a day in your life using ATEA. You start your day, you have to go to the airport, you book your flight, you enjoy the view, and you arrive without stress at the airport. You leave your business meeting and go back at home at night. It is fast, hassle-free. It increases your productivity, but also your free time. And it's a huge market that will be unlocked from the existing helicopter niche market. Today, it was $3 billion a year. But thanks to this innovative solution, it will scale up to more than 20 billion Euro, US dollars a year by 2030. As it is huge, there was a lot of competition. But our competitor focus on the full battery technology that is very limited, and they will only offer intra-city trip. When at ascendance, our vision leaders at a regional level, thanks to our hybrid electric technology. We'll be able to propose city to suburban, city to city trip, and even city to island trip. 
we will lead this market. Today, we are focused on the product development. We flew with a subscale and we are preparing a scale one prototype. From 2022, we start an aircraft pre-sales campaign, generating revenues, and will have a worldwide impact and visibility thanks to the Paris Olympic Games in 2024, where we'll have a demonstration line. From 2025, our market entry will be an air mobility provider, but we'll also sell the key technology bricks that will enable greener aviation. By 2030, it will be more than 4,000 ATEA flying in the sky. The funding team is from IFAN. Pioneering electric aircraft at Airbus, we crossed historically the channel, thanks to the IFAN, from UK to France in 2015. Ascendance is the continuity of our journey to electric aviation. Since February, we raised more than 1 million US dollars in safe bonds and we signed a strategic partnership with Paris Airport to fly at the Paris Olympic Games. We'll be more than happy to discuss a project with you. You have all my contact details on this slide, so feel free to contact me. Thanks a lot for your attention. Bye. Thank you, John Christophe. Um, next up, based out of Tel Aviv, Israel, we have Alad Schaefer from Zener, a technology that empowers travelers through use of an AI-powered digital concierge. Hello, everyone. My name is Elad, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Zener. Like all of you, we love travel, and despite the challenging times for this industry, we know travel will bounce back. But in order to accelerate that, we need to restore everyone's sense of confidence and safety when they travel. At Zener, we empower travelers through an AI-powered travel assistant, keeping them safe, moving, and feeling zen when they're on the road. Travel was a time-consuming and stressful experience long before the coronavirus. Dealing with fragmented and disintegrated travel providers, dealing with flight delays and cancellations, making a tight connection when the stakes are high, these are all problem problems that are exacerbated when you navigate an unfamiliar airport, and even more so today when countries constantly change their immigration and health rules. And if you're a corporate travel manager or a TMC, you know this doesn't stop with stress and loss of time. A delayed and tired traveler results in additional spend on hotels and flight changes, in loss of productivity, loss of business opportunities, and higher attrition rates. Whereas a great, smooth trip, on the other hand, results in a fresh, productive traveler able to accomplish their goals. That is why Zener is building a smart travel assistant, always on your side and by your side. Zeni is our traveler-first technology solution, serving as a single hub for the traveler's post-booking needs, fully integrated with your travel providers. Zeni is always tracking your journey, anticipating issues and proactively protecting you from problems big and small. At Zener, we want to 10x your travel experience. We currently do it in three core ways. First, with flight intelligence, providing real-time monitoring of your journey, contextual and proactive updates on your flight, the airport and any change to your itinerary, including immigration and health restrictions. Second, we detect and resolve flight disruptions. Leveraging public and proprietary data, Zeni's AI can detect that a flight will be canceled or delayed, often long before it is recognized and announced. We therefore use this time advantage to promptly alert the traveler and help them instantly rebook themselves onto another flight before the competition to find an alternative route or a flight has even begun. That means that Zener is the first to secure a resolution to its travelers with no lines and no stress. Finally, Zeni supports travelers on tight connections. When the stakes are high, Zeni feeds the traveler with the real-time advice on how to navigate and make that tight connection, where to go, which line to take, and what to tell the airline staff. We're also working on additional integrations and functionalities for proactive automated support to travelers, such as arrival advice and all the way through to full-blown concierge needs. But Zeni's intelligence doesn't stop there. It is interactive. It allows travelers to ask questions, seek updates, and make requests. Zeni learns the right answers in real time and ensures that you're given the most accurate advice. It is currently available through text and email and requires no app to download. 
We're also developing some tools for travel managers, enabling them to keep track on how Zenny is helping their travelers, keeping them moving and safe. Zenner is working with corporate travel managers, reducing their travel flight disruptions costs, increasing productivity, keeping employees happy and safe, and ensuring business continuity and duty of care. We're also supporting travel management companies, helping them to be more proactive and automated, amplify their digital presence, reduce staff overload, and increase customer satisfaction. The team behind Zenner has worked together as co-founders of technology startups for over 10 years now. We are road warriors who combine passion for data with love of travel. We're proudly backed by F2 Capital and select angel investors and have an amazing team of advisors helping to position us for success. Lastly, we know this is a hard time for the industry and that a lot of talent was unfortunately furloughed or let go. So if you're a talented developer, product manager, or sales salesperson with a passion for travel, talk to us. If COVID-19 taught us anything, it is that travelers will be even more concerned about having a safe, smooth, and uninterrupted travel experience. Travelers need, now more than ever, a truly smart, proactive travel solution that looks after them every step of the way, keeping them moving, safe, and zen. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, next, based out of Pittsburgh, we have Salvam Orju from Juve Robotics, an autonomous baggage tug. Hi, my name is Salvam, a co-founder of Juvo Robotics, and I'm here to talk to you about how Juvo will enable the future of aircraft ground handling. Aircraft ground handling is the $185 billion industry that deals with anything and everything that happens around a plane when it's on the ground. This industry is plagued by several issues such as labor shortage, poor efficiency, and safety issues to both personal and to million dollar equipment. Our aim at Juvo is to bring the team's expertise in robotics and artificial intelligence to make the aircraft ground handling smarter, safer, and more efficient. We chose to start with the most labor intensive problem in this area, which brings us to baggage handling. In a nutshell, baggage handling can be put into three major buckets, loading and unloading at the loading station, transportation and loading and unloading at the aircraft. We're currently working on automating the loading and unloading at the baggage station and automating the transport of these bags. And to airlines, this means over 50% in cost savings, better equipment utilization, and no more accidents, as safety is fundamental to our technology. Today, it can cost an airline up to $15 to transport a bag from a customer and back to the customer at the destination. And we hope to be able to give the airlines over 50% of that money back. So far, Here's our progress. We have a fully automated baggage tow tractor that can travel from any point to any point in an airport, indoors and outdoors. The vehicle's onboard sensor suite with LIDARs, radars, IMU, GPS, and sonars enable the vehicle to navigate safely around obstacles and follow the rules of the airport. We also offer additional features like RFID-based access control, fleet management, and autonomous docking and charging. Here I'll be talking a bit about our revenue strategy for the autonomous tow tractor alone. We're still working on the specifics for the loading and unloading units and happy to present those details if you're interested in a follow-up meeting. 
With the ATT, we plan on making money through three-year contracts where year one is paid up front and then there will be a monthly subscription fee for the autonomy. With this product line alone, we can get to over 60 million in revenue in five years. And these numbers are much larger for the fully packaged baggage handling automation. Juvo was founded in 2018 and with our autonomous tow tractor prototype, we were able to raise some seed funding. We're using that to develop the baggage loading and unloading prototypes while making ATT production ready. We're also in talks with several airlines to start pilot trials and by next year we'll have our first product launches. Between the founders, we have Carnegie Mellon grads with over 15 years in collective experience in both robotics and business development, working in early stage startups, making robots from scratch to deploying robots that are operating 24 seven throughout the United States. Once again, we are Juvo Robotics and we're here to automate the future of aircraft down handling. Thank you and please get in touch. Thank you, Savant. Um... Up next, the last of our Silicon Valley travel and hospitality startup is based out of London. We have Gavin Watts from Yoti, a digital identity system that provides a simple and secure way of proving identities online and face-to-face. -face. Hello, I'm Gavin from Yoti, Commercial Director of Government and Transport. And today I'm gonna to take the opportunity to build on previous presentations and discuss how Yoti can assist with reviving the travel industry post COVID-19 lockdown through digital identities and health certificates. So the industry is facing some challenging times right now. Uh, firstly, the challenge of reopening borders whilst containing the virus and increasing the use of self-service to reduce human contact, but equally addressing current challenges of um, best utilizing our real estate within our ports uh, and ensuring that accurate information for passengers is passed ahead of travel. Firstly though, a recap on what Yoti is. So Yoti is a secure identity wallet that is able to absorb credentials from a number of areas. First of those being government issue credentials from your passport or your driving license or your national ID card. But then equally, it's credentials that have been issued from source. So for example, that could be my work identity, it could be a frequent flyer number, or it could be a COVID-19 health status that's been issued either by a government or from a testing laboratory. These credentials are all stored securely under the control of the individual that owns them. And they can be shared with consent with any business that is within our ecosystem, be that an airline or an airport, a car hire company or a hotel. Diving into the COVID-19 status in a little more detail, a test result can be combined with a verified identity and consumed within the wallet and stored as per those other attributes that they discussed. And then that attribute can be shared with a requesting business um, for a transaction. So in that way, the Yoti value proposition is to uh, facilitate contactless cell service through home enrollment, but also increase confidence in the health of your passengers at the point of travel. So how does this work? Through a simple integration into your platform, Yoti is able to provide the unique facial biometric combined with the passport information derived from the chip, as well as the COVID-19 status at point check-in, which when combined with the boarding pass will form a single token that can be used downstream. When that passenger arrives at the port, their face then becomes their passport, required no documents and increased use of self-service. So at bag drop or security or the boarding gate, the passenger simply uses their face to authenticate who they are and pass through that specific checkpoint. Equally at the destination, this can also be leveraged to collect a hire car or to check into a hotel. So we've been working on this concept for the last few years with Heathrow and this video will show you how that works. You'll see an individual using Yoti to scan a QR code, then taking a selfie to authenticate who they are to then pass that verified information through to the relying party. Yoti removes the need to complete web form forms when you check in for your flight and makes moving through the airport a lot easier. With a simple click of a button, I can pass my passport information and my biometric picture through to the airline, which, when combined with my boarding pass, creates a single token that is then made available to the airport. So at self-service backdrop, I scan the boarding pass, I look into the camera, and my face is matched against that token, allowing me to proceed with the rest of that process. 
And finally, as I reached the boarding gate, I simply look into the camera in order to board and take my seat. So this technology is available now. Through our work with Heathrow, we've proved that it's possible to provide that information to the airline. And we've also demonstrated the reduction in transaction time that can be achieved, not to mention the reduction in uh, human interaction and the social distancing measures that we're currently experiencing. And it's a very simple addition to add a COVID status on top of this. I appreciate your time today. Many thanks for listening. I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, now up next, first of our EU batch startups, we have Theory from Cosmo Tech, a company from France who has developed a modeling and simulation platform for complex systems. Hello, my name is Thierry Delumelet. I am in charge of business development at Cosmo Tech. I am very happy to be here with you today. Cosmo Tech is a global software vendor of enterprise digital twin solutions for the industry to simulate and optimize operational efficiency. Our enterprise digital twin technology is based on a proprietary language called COSML that stems from more than 20 years of research. It is the heart of our digital twin platform. Cosmotech modelers can quickly and easily represent heterogeneous systems in a multi-scale time and space environment. This powers efficient mapping of real world business and operational systems, including all of their interconnections as they really are and as they evolve over time. We help our customers to address a range of challenges that they face every day in fields of transportation, energy, utilities, and manufacturing. Essentially, our technology gives users the capability to accurately predict how their complex industrial systems will evolve over a period of time that they choose from 15 minutes into the future out to 50 years. With the Cosmotech Enterprise Digital Twin, you create a replica of your complex system, taking into account the processes you have in place, the resources, HR, financial, and any other concern pertinent for the simulation. With the Digital Twin, you can run unlimited what-if scenarios and how-to optimizations to come up with the optimal plan to balance performance and cost in line with your company goals and KPIs. These are some of the examples of digital twins built with our software in the area of transportation. Let's look closer at a couple of examples. In the case of today's topic, we can look specifically at network supervision, where we have worked on projects such as the supervision of human flows in airports, usually with a prediction window of just 15 minutes. We have also worked with RATP, operator of the subway lines in Paris, that see 12 million passengers each day. The digital twin that was built allowed RATP to optimize the supervision and flow of passengers across bus, train, tram, and metro services. The digital twin solution has provided them with the ability to forecast traffic flows and make decisions to enhance the passenger experience. We worked with Alstom to design an optimal railway system. The digital twin simulated a network and includes constraints such as rolling stock infrastructure, signaling and services. We were able to propose a system organization that optimized total cost of ownership and allowed our client to reduce headways, optimize timetables, manage disturbances on the network while increasing resilience and efficiency. Thanks to Cosmotech Enterprise Digital Twins, you can run an unlimited number of what-if scenarios to virtually test, then predict the impact of any decision before its implementation, and run how-to optimizations to prescribe the optimal course of action and reach your KPIs. You unlock hidden value very often by visualizing cascading effects. The recommendations from the tool are transparent. It is not a black box you can understand every part of the simulation. This is very important, of course, when you must make big decisions. Our software platform is cloud-based architecture that guarantees scalability and security. Best of all, you can start creating value in three months. Thank you very much for your time. You can find us at cosmotech.com.
Thank you, Terry. Um, up next, based out of Massachusetts, we have Jesper Nielsen from CyberX, a platform with robust solution for reducing risk from unmanaged IoT devices. Hello, everyone. Jesper Nielsen is my name. I represent CyberX. We are a cybersecurity company that focuses on securing IoT and OT devices and networks. So when everyone is moving into Industry 4.0 and digitalizing everything from coffee machines to fridges to building sensors to doors to um, skater networks, so Siemens, ABB, Rockwell machines, etc., we make sure that with when you enlarge the footprint of your organization, that you're not enlarging the target area that you can get hacked on. So we make sure that we cover that for you. So basically, uh, we cover four types of risk uh, that can happen. Downtime, uh, if you have an IT breach, you can be back up if you have a good uh, hardware provider, depending on your size of your company, of course, and the size of the breach, but you can be back up within days. If you have a SCADA breach, that can be two, three days uh, that you're down. Then if your machine is attacked, the PLCs, that can be a couple of months. So the financial losses and the financial impact can be enormous. We have catastrophic and safety incidents. Um, we had one attack in uh, the, the Middle East where a uh, flow sensor or a pressure sensor on a gas pipeline was compromised, uh, reporting back to the central uh, unit that everything was okay, uh, when in fact the pressure was seven or eight times over the threshold, so it exploded. Um, it was only severe financial loss on it and environmental uh, impact, of course, but uh, no people were killed, uh, luckily that one so we have environment incidents like that we also have when they attack chemical plants uh, cause explosion of fires releasing toxic gases or compromising fresh water supplies uh, attacking dams and uh, and uh, sewage uh, the most number of attacks is probably around uh, theft of intellectual capity, uh, capital um, basically if you are a researching a uh, medicine company, researching for a new drug before you have a patent. If they compromise the machines of the laboratories where you work in and they can see from the settings of the machines uh, how to make the drug, how to produce it, and they are very <laughs> equipped in producing drugs very fast. So that can have severe uh, um, impact as well. So the challenges we address for clients is, um, first of all, knowing what you have. Uh, what IoT assets you have and OT assets you have, knowing how they're communicating with each other. Second step is uh, risk and vulnerability management. So listing up all the CVs of so the known hacking exposures that you have in the software so you can update the right devices at the right time. So you can do firewall segmentation and that stuff. Then we have continuous IoT and OT threat monitoring. Uh, the newest generation of malware um, when they embed themselves, they mask themselves as a normal software that should be on that hardware that they've compromised. So if you don't know how the hardware should behave or how should it, how it should communicate, uh, you can't pick it up. That's why um, by continuous monitoring, we see any changes in behavior that shouldn't be there. Then you have operational efficiency, making sure that you have no false stop, stop commands, unnecessary connections in the internet, um, topology, questions, all those kind of things. Then we make sure to get this information to the right person in the right format, in the right place, so you can have that technology process and people triangle that is so important. Uh, the partners we embed this with uh, is Palo uh, Alto Splunk, um, ServiceNow, Cisco, Microsoft Azure, uh, coming big in this space. That was it, thank you very much. Thank you, Jasper. Now based out of India, uh, with Babu from Jiffy.ai, a platform that empowers businesses with AI powered intelligent automation solutions to, to solve complex business problems. Hello everybody. My name is Babu Sivadasan and I am the co-founder and CEO of Jiffy.ai. I'm very honored to be presenting at the plug and play Spring Summit. As a global family, we are living through an unbelievably challenging time. In many industries, business have come to a complete standstill with significant drop in revenues. Companies are forced to reduce workforce and ask a massive number of employees to work from home. 
to add insult to injury, core systems within these enterprises are experiencing tremendous stress, especially in areas they never imagined or planned for. The solution to this problem is core application automation that can scale much better than the human dependent processes. We are Jiffy.ai, pioneers in app-based automation. We are a unique startup with a global team of 150, led by an unbelievable team of 20 co-founders. We are making waves as an intelligent automation disruptor. In a short span of time, eight Fortune 500 companies rely on us to build resilient mid and back office systems. We are a socially conscious company. At our core, we are the only automation company whose business model is structured to provide support and funding to upskill and reskill our clients' associates who may be impacted by automation. With automation set to impact 400 plus million jobs by 2030, we believe in being a truly socially responsible innovator. We are the world's first company to deliver a platform that can deploy an array of automation applications for the whole enterprise. We provide AI-based automation apps to unify, modernize, fortify, and advance the enterprise business processes to make them resilient, especially to handle challenging times like this. If your organization has not embarked on the, an automation journey, we would love to show you how it could be done. If you have advanced further on this journey and feel trapped by bots, by oversold and unmet promises, we would love to demonstrate how real impact and ROI can be achieved by using app automation. Our platform takes the mystery out of automation process, bridging the human machine divide and bringing high performance automation to the enterprises. I would like to share an example of how we helped one of our clients in record time to manage a significant challenge brought on by the coronavirus pandemic. When the coronavirus pandemic hit, our client, a leading well-managed US airline, needed help. They needed help in managing the massive influx of requests for cancellations, refunds, and postponements. Typically, the refund queues are averaging at about 4,300 transactions. In less than three weeks, that queue grew to over 90,000 transactions. That represented approximately 2,000 person hours to handle it. Processes were obviously not designed to handle such a sudden spike. Staff shortages compounded the problem. We delivered an automated process in record time, deployed the pro into production in two weeks. Ultimately, the result has been that you know, we cleared thousands of manual paperwork backlogs, saved 2,000 plus person hours of work, processed nearly 90,000 transactions in less than a week, and reduced the overall call center volumes, response times, and operating costs, and delivering to the clients, the consumers, peace of mind that you know, their rescheduling requests or cancellation requests have been processed accurately. Here is an example of one such process, you know, an exchange, ticket exchange process automation, right? You now that is deployed using one of our technologies. An intuitive, powerful design studio enables users to seamlessly put together automation applications and workflows very, very quickly. In summary, we are helping clients in the new now. We have a strong foundation of excellent client relationships and credible install base. We help our clients to be resilient, 
that is adapting to volatile situations like this, you know, with uh, record speed. Client centricity, improve the efficiencies and accuracy of processing client requests and cost effectiveness, streamlining the operational processes. That's what we do. Thank you for the opportunity. And for more information on us, please visit our website at www.gfi.ai. Thank you. Hey, you guys, this is Amir. Uh, we have one more startup uh, to show you guys, but uh, uh, the representative from uh, the corporation that's getting the uh, Corporate Innovation Award has a hard stop in a few minutes. So what we wanted to do was award the Corporate Innovation Award and then show you the last startup. Uh, and then that will be followed by the Startup Award. Um, it is with my great pleasure uh, to give this Expo's Corporate In Innovation Award to one of our long-lasting corporate partners, CWT. Uh, CWT has been a great partner of ours since we started the travel and hospitality practice back in 2016, and they've come up with a very unique model to go through their digital transformation uh, including the way they collaborate with startups, as well as engaging their customers in uh, getting introduced to startups and understanding what is relevant for them. On behalf of uh, CWT, it's my pleasure to introduce John Pellant. John is the Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer reporting to the President and Chief Executive Officer at CWT. He's also a member of the Global Executive Leadership Team. He's been with CWT since 91. Uh, across various leadership positions with both global and America's remits and is at the forefront of helping to deliver the company's CWT 3.0 strategy. John is also a board member for the Orphan Starfish Foundation, a member of the Defender Circle at Thorne and leads the CWT Responsible Business Program in the Americas. John, it's an absolute pleasure to be giving CWT and yourself this award and we appreciate your time we would appreciate a few words from your side. Thank you for being with us. Absolutely, and, and thank you, uh, Amir. It, you know, it's an absolute honor um, for me to be able to accept this award on behalf of CWT and so many people that have you know, worked with Plug and Play. We look at innovation as a key driver for our culture and how we look at kind of that customer experience. And, and we're so proud to be an anchor partner um, with Plug and Play and the Travel and Hospitality or Vertical, and we've been doing that since 2016. Um, you know, one of the key things for us when we look at our innovation strategy is really to scout, scan, engage, you know, the external innovation and bring it to our customers. We feel like that allows us to move at a much quicker pace um, and partnering with startups, such as being, um, you know, displayed here today really is important to us from a strategy standpoint. I, you know, one of the things I'd like to call out that's uh, a key part for us has been our fantastic strategy and partnership around hosting um, at the various plug and play locations. And that's one of the cornerstones for us is that the plug and play team along with our innovation and new product development team have been able to host um, client innovation labs. Last year, we hosted over 50 of those. And that gives us you know, a really unique way to be able to brainstorm with our customers to solve their problems. Um, they really appreciate kind of being able to roll up their sleeves and have those discussions. Um, and it's, it's just an important part of how we bring um, kind of what we do and along with plug and play and all of our partners there to our customers. And, we look at that as a key piece. And I think, you know, not only in the travel um, vertical, but also we benefit from insights from the other verticals um, at plug, plug and play and well, FinTech and IoT and cybersecurity, the other areas that our team is able to dig into. Um, so that's just been so important to us and some of the key um, different products that we've been able to and companies that we've been able to partner with to, uh, to go to market for our customers. So 
I, just to close it out, I want to thank Plug and Play, Amir, for your partnership on this journey. Um, I, I look at you and your team along with CWT as an extension of our family. So I'm really honored to accept this award on behalf of CWT. Um, you guys know some of our key people, uh, Patrice Simone and Brandon Belcom, some of those guys that spend a lot of time with you. Um, so it's really on their behalf and what they, we've been able to accomplish together. So thank you so much. Thank you, John. And I know you were not with us during the opening remarks. I do apologize for my mustache, but the reason for the ugly mustache is I started growing it and I'm gonna keep growing it till travel goes back to 50% capacity. Uh, so for my sake- it's a, it's a good look. I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I like it. Yes, so hopefully that will happen sooner than later for the sake of my marriage. My wife absolutely hates it. Um, on a serious note, I really wanted to thank you and your team, Brandon, Patrice, Lindsay, and a lot of other folks uh, behind the scenes who have made this partnership a fruitful one. I know from the perspective of the startups, um, as well as other corporate partners who've had interactions with your team members, uh, it's been a, uh, your contribution to our ecosystem has been tremendous and we look forward to hopefully building on an already very strong partnership in months to come and years to come. I think more than ever, it's important for everybody in the travel industry to be collaborating closely with one another and hopefully get the travel industry back on track. Um, thank you so much for everything you've done and we look forward to continuing on our partnership in coming months and years. And thank you for your time today. I know you're a very busy man these days. No, for sure. And I, I agree. I think, you know, looking at the different ways that we can partner um, and looking at different startups, there's going to be so many new opportunities um, to solve the challenges that we're going to come um, out of this crisis. It, it will be very interesting to see what we can do from a technology standpoint, really to solve those business problems. So it's going to be great. Looking forward to it, John. I know you have a hard stop. Thank you right. for your time and congratulations again. It's an honor to be giving the Corporate Innovation Award to CWT. It's well, well deserved. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. With that, uh, we're going to go to our regularly scheduled uh, content. Sorry about that, Jesse. Uh, the last startup from our Travel EU program, and then we'll go to the startup uh, in a, uh, award, is, uh, which Chris. Thank will you, Amir. I appreciate it. Yeah, we'll proceed with the last startup presentation that we do have for you guys today. Um, but last but not least, based out of Germany and San Francisco, we have Amit from D-Drone, the airspace security platform that detects, classifies, and mitigates all drone threats. Hello, my name is Amit Samani and I'm the Vice President of Sales for D-Drone, the market leader in lower level airspace security. Today, I will be providing an overview of low level airspace and how unmanned aerial vehicle, uh, which is widely known as drones, are of such a concern to the travel industry. My presentation will be aimed at demonstrating a framework and strategy that D-Drone strongly believes is needed to tackle this complex and emerging threat. D-Drone is the market leader in airspace security and provides a platform to integrate detect drone detecting sensors to provide security teams with vital information to defend their sites. The platform has been deployed across hundreds of clients across numerous markets ranging from major events, G7 militaries, critical national infrastructure, and most notably numerous airports globally. Our investors include John Chambers, former CEO of Cisco Networks, Andy Betrelstein, co-founder of Sun Microsystems, Stefan Quant, largest shareholder of BMW, and all believe as passionately as D-Drone that the next major security threat will come from airborne attacks. Industry analyst PricewaterhouseCoopers has estimated the market cap for the drone industry will be $127 billion. So far, the drone industry has stagnated due to fear, uncertainty, and doubt created by the market and its negative perception in the media. Our world, however, is continuously evolving and recent events caused by the coronavirus pandemic demonstrates how our collective dependencies are intertwined. The effects of COVID have finally resulted in greater adoption of drones by the first responder communities for social distancing, surveillance, and most recently, deliveries for medical supplies to remote locations. Those early predictions of proliferation of drone usage are finally being realized and the use of drones will exponentially grow when the pandemic is under control as the general public now sees the value and accepts the risks. The impacts of COVID-19 have led to a major short to medium term challenge for the aviation industry. There is now a concern around how the avi aviation industry will be impacted once travel restrictions are lifted. As demonstrated in the data below, COVID has led to a surge of detections across major cities, 
This is consistent with what we're seeing in our global installations. At a time like this, it is imperative that the aviation industry safeguards against more um, challenges around safety and security. There has been numerous events reported in the media. However, what is difficult to get any truth data on the magnitude of the threat. Today, most data is based around pilot sighting of drones, which is often inaccurate. This is why D-Drone published a recent study of seven UK international airports to assess the true extent of the threat. During 238 day study, we detected 380 unique drones that were flying within the illegal limits of one kilometer from the perimeter of the airfield. Interestingly, DGI, the market leader in consumer drones, represent, who claims to have 80% market share, only represented 53% of the drones detected. Today, there is a limit of five kilometers from the uh, perimeter of the airfield, yet we see data increasing. This data has led to airports building st uh, strategies to educate their communities with an aim to reducing data and events near airfields. Now, a typical question I always get is, how do I shoot down a drone? Whilst this is a natural reaction, the realities of such actions can have a significant commercial impact due to collateral, co collateral physical or reputational damage. D-Drone does offer the ability to neutralize a drone, but we are seeing our aviation clients being balanced in their airspace security strategies. Typically, we're seeing most airports begin their journey with a cost-effective threat assessment to quantify the risk rather than wastefully invest millions into untested and unnecessary solutions. Once an airport achieves situation awareness, like other security systems, the main outcome should be how to use the data to build standard operating procedures. If you consider the threats posed by a drone, such as surveillance, disruption and weaponization, etc., you would already see that there are some clearly defined procedures to defend against these, albeit in land-based formats. D-Drone is seeing our clients amend these procedures for the uh, oncoming and emerging threat posed by drones. So what stands D-Drone apart in this uh, fairly congested market? Well, it's simple. Our platform is already deployed in numerous airports and has been tested and approved by a government agency in the UK called the CPNI in what was the first global exercise to identify vendors who can actually prove their technology works. D-Drone was tested and approved to defend organisations against highly complex threats and anticipated scenarios. So this is a demonstration of our platform in use. The aim is to, to enable security teams to be alerted when drones come in within the proximity of the location and to respond to take action to secure their critical assets. We're seeing this data lead to a number of outcomes ranging from arrests, community education and safeguarding of locations. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much for listening and wish you a safe and healthy re remainder of your time with uh, Plug and Play. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amit, and uh, sincere apologies for, for cutting you off and going a little bit out of order. That actually concludes all 21 startup presentations, but we're not over with the session yet. We still do have one more portion, um, but I would like to just acknowledge the resilience and strength that all these companies have demonstrated during these times. I wish we could all give you a big round of applause. Uh, I actually threw out the idea that we all turn on our mics and, and clap, but that didn't get too good of feedback. Didn't get the green light from management on that one. But uh, with that being said, I'd like to proceed to the last portion of today's session, pass it back to Christy, our Ventures Associate, to announce our Startup Award winner. Thanks, Jesse. I think you put it really well. Um, it's been quite a difficult few months to say the least, but our team have been so impressed and inspired by so many of the startups, not only in our ecosystem, but more specifically in our batch nine who have had um, a bit of an unconventional program than we usually do. So with that being said, uh, we really want to recognize one particular startup that has actually grown throughout the past few months and has been an inspiration to us all. So the startup award for batch nine will go to... <laughs> Troop Travel, Dennis, if you're ready, um, please say a couple of words. Congratulations. Uh, thanks a lot, Christy. I mean, this is, uh, this is really amazing. I mean, especially for us as a uh, early startup uh, based in Spain, based in South Africa, uh, uh, getting this kind of recognition. I mean, this is really, really, really exciting. And uh, thanks to all of you. And actually, uh, I had my ticket booked already to to the first to the focus week in San Francisco, and then we decided well everything goes virtual. So we have been enjoying the acceleration program virtually, which was an interesting experience. And actually, the first focus week was really really incredible for us because we got a lot of feedback from the mentors, which then helped us actually to really to see what are these key elements we have to take into consideration of thinking about the new normal of how will we look at meetings and events planning. And I think. 
maybe we can all relate a bit to that. We are now maybe used to do these kind of virtual uh, virtual meetings and uh, and everything, but uh, I think we are actually really looking forward to meet in person again with people. And it's now actually when we link uh, when we think about meetings and events, planning a meeting, it's about that we meet, and not necessarily around that we have to meet in a specific place. So we are actually becoming much more flexible and we are much more open to ask the question of where do we meet? And this is in the end what we are solving. And yeah, thanks again for this. And uh, it's really, really an amazing recognition for the whole team who has been working on this. And thanks, plug and play team. Thanks, Dennis. Congrats again. And we hope to see you and everyone else really soon. So with that, um, pass it back to Leo for our closing remarks. Thank you, Christy. Uh, once again, I would like to echo what Jesse and Christy just said, giving a big shout out to all of the startups in you know, our batch nine program in Silicon Valley here, as well as batch one program in Vienna. Their active participation and level of engagement in the past three months is truly a source of inspiration to all of us here at Plug and Play. I also want to thank our corporate partners and mentors for giving their valuable time to our entrepreneurs in spite of the challenging times. Speaking of which, COVID-19 shocked the best of us with how quickly it became a global pandemic from being just a epidemic within China. However, our society came together more united than ever with so many inspiring stories that touch our daily lives. We're in this together as a phrase means so much more than just a few words in a marketing campaign. That said, the curious and creative ones have already started putting together a COVID-19 buzzword bingo, including words like unprecedented, the new normal, Zoom, work from home, and oh, how could you not include Trump on that bingo board? But anyway, before we get too carried away with the bingo, let's not forget about all the men and women out there going above and beyond to save lives and help people to get well. Hence our heart and the word cloud in the center of the previous screen. Lastly, I would like to send, thank each and every member of our global travel and marketing team for producing today's virtual expo. While the timeline of recovery still remains uncertain, we have no doubt that our industry will bounce back. From all of us here at Plug and Play, thank you for sharing your valuable time with us today. For the corporate partners, we look forward to seeing you during our Batch 10 Selection Day, hopefully during better times for the industry. Our best to you and your loved ones, no matter where you are, be safe and stay healthy. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.